Hello, good morning, and welcome. I'm Ayo Makine, and I am happy to let you know that today I'm not alone. <laughs> She's back. She's back. Hi. She's back. <laughs> Sorry, director, I changed the script. <laughs> Happy to see you too. Same here. Oh, the see. eye that see you is old. Sorry. It's very old. In the yeah. that's the way you reverse. Yes, I I I used to understand. <laughs> I used to understand. It's good to see you. How have you been? Very well. Well, just in case you notice that somebody is not here, it's because she's actually not here. <laughs> she just had to clone herself here. She, 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 you know, well, you know the, that uh, that comedian Kenny Black who say, "I just got back." Yeah, yeah, she just got back. You know, what I'm saying. So if you were um, on the same flight one yesterday, a, isn't one entitled to a holiday? Yes, one is. Everyone is entitled to a holiday, but in broadcasting, you know that sometimes you just, you are on holiday officially. The show must go. On. <laughs> that is our slogan, isn't it? The show must go. Yes, on. I know you have loads of questions. Before first of you all, start asking your first question. of all, mm. it's good to be back. Yes. I'm glad to be here. Yes, because but you Saturday came... without sunrise mm. is not a Saturday. You mean the sunrise? Sun hasn't risen until sunrise. until today. Mm. Oh, thank yeah. you very much. Isn't you know, it, it, it's good to be appreciated. You know. By the way, have you have you had a cup of coffee? My he my head is almost. No, no, no burst that's why we tied it. <laughs> so you got a bus. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have you had your cup of cocoa this morning? Oh yes, uh, I think I'll opt for cocoa. cocoa. Mm. I had my cup of cocoa this morning because I missed cocoa while I was away. Yes. Mm. Yeah, you can't have cocoa there. No, no, no. There's no cocoa there. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever you go. <laughs> It's no cocoa. <laughs> it's no cocoa. <laughs> like the cocoa in Nigeria. When you said wherever you go, I remember that song. Mm -hmm. go, wherever go, go, you go, 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 go. go, go. go. Mm. So wherever you went, <laughs> where, 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 where. <laughs> whatever you do, 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 do. do. <laughs> so how is, um, okay, I know you didn't go to see the king. No, I didn't. I didn't. Mm. I didn't. Mm. But um, one tried to keep up with happenings in Nigeria, yes, I and know. Um, the Nigerian always takes the, Ni the, the, the Nigerian always takes Nigeria along. They were quite depressing, and the most depressing of them all was the one that happened last week, the latest hike in the fuel price. Oh well, that was going to happen. What do you mean? I mean, Labour was still screaming that where it was was still too much and one of the terms of their agreement to to accepting 70,000 was the mm. government would revert that was going to happen it's just coming 50 years late um you lost me <laughs> 50 years late we, about what I, time do we people can hardly eat it is so depressing and when i arrived i then asked so with this new price, how are people moving around? And the driver that fetched me said, people are walking. I said, well, there's always a good side to something. So we're going to be a very fit nation <laughs> since we're all exercising by default. You know, when I said, you know, it's coming 50 years late, you know that this whole subsidy thing started far back then. And there are those, even specialists. Okay, let me let me let me let you know what a, a, an industry specialist, you know, told us on Channels Television uh, not too long ago, uh, talking about the fact that look, whether we want to accept it or not, Dangote may not sell below NNPCL's petrol price, and his reason is that the fuel that uh, Dangote is selling is the best in the world, and what does that mean? It means that. It has to cost a little more. Dangote already told us that. <laughs> look, um, it has um, it has that. Uh, it, 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 it's like pure water, very pure, very plain. Euro oh, something God. something quality. And it's, if it's the best in the world, you have to pay the quality price of the best. You will save on engine. So what was all that stuff about? Dangote quality was not good and all that that we heard a few weeks ago. 
before Dan Goethe now came out himself to defend the quality of what he was producing? I think that question should not be put to me. It should be put to the NMDPRA boss. No, I'm just making an observation. Oh, no, that's a question. In case you haven't observed. Uh, well, um, <laughs> to the person who said that it was not good quality, mm. what, has he, what has he said now? What has he to say now? When the man has come out and shown us the quality, I mean, well, shown us the fuel. Mm. Because we can't test the quality with our eyes. Mm. So at least it's not pure water. Well, uh, it is fuel. It's fuel. So you can't just drink it. Oh, you can try. <laughs> <laughs> it's your <Yeah>. no choice. <laughs> so it's painful. I mean, what you when you when you reference the fact that people have to walk long distances, yes. it is very very painful. Add that to the fact that people have to queue long hours to get fuel. Oh God, the queues I saw this morning. Now, the only thing that you know has come out from the federal government about that, well, what I would say the most reliable thing mm. is what we understand that the president himself said when he he told um, the pressmen that look, these are hard decisions that are necessary to take for development to happen. My problem is not the hard decisions, you know, as we often say on this program. My problem is communication. We will own it. I remember, you know, I told you, my dad sat myself and my younger brother down when we were on the 10. said, guys, um, milk don't they cost too. So um, we may be doing without milk. My dad said, we told him that it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay that whatever we have, we'll be okay with. He communicated with us. So just imagine that dad just said, no milk. Or we wanted to eat what we normally would. Then it was the days of conflicts. <laughs> You know, we want to have conflicts. There is no milk. And we asked mommy, where is milk? Mommy said, no, you drink it like that with no milk. Oh. Ah, drink it with water. You are looking for rebellion. Oh, dear. <laughs> we we rebel. Oh we dear. were boys. Oh, dear. You know? But dad sat us down and said this, this, this. And my dad said, we understood. And that he almost shed tears. So Nigerians are that resilient. Hey. But what do we always say on this program? Tell us. That's it. We might even sympathize with you. We might just understand. And you will shed tears on TV. I mean, and you don't, you don't want to believe that we can actually, you know, sympathize with you. That's the it thing. It's possible. It's possible. We will sympathize. I but mean, we need to know what's happening. That's one. Secondly, the money that is being saved, is it being saved? No. The extra money that is coming from the uh, subsidy, mm. is it being saved or yeah, being but, spent? You know, but this subsidy thing, they keep telling us that they are still paying subsidy. Okay. Now that they say that, uh, in fact, what, what the president we don't told... don't even know what the truth is anymore. Hmm. They will tell they, us they, one... They, the same day will tell us one thing today. Hmm. Tell us... Remember a, a few years ago, when Timipri Silva was Minister of State, and he came and said, oh, partial subsidy has gone. And then, uh, I can't remember, somebody interviewed him and he was now speaking from both sides of his mouth. So we didn't know what he was saying. Well, um, the English word being used these days, <laughs> from what I understand, is um, shortfall. Shortfall. Not subsidy. You know, when um, we had a political okay. unpass, that was the first time we were hearing the word unpass in our lexicon in Nigeria. That was in the All 90s. Right. So mm. maybe shortfall is the new one that we'll be coming up with. Now. I don't know. You wanted to tell us where we are going first today. Yes. So welcome back. Thank you very much. Back to the basics. <laughs> back to back life. Back to the grindstone. Back to reality. <laughs> so, I mean... Aptly, we're going to start with the fuel. I mean, living with high cost of fuel, that's where we're going to start this program Absolutely. today. I mean, and, aptly. Um, we've talked about unpaid pensioners for a while. Well, that's part of what we are talking about this morning. Unpaid NITEL, MTEL pensioners. What's that all about? And then our focus will shift to the Junior Achievement Nigeria Lead Camp. Mm-hmm. Le raising leaders for tomorrow. And then school is about to resume. Some are resuming on Monday. Some are resuming subsequently. So what's the kind of nutrition that we should be giving our children in the name of living with high cost of food? Ben. And of course, as is usual, we shall close with the Artist of the Week segment. And I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag. There's no cat. Oh, okay. I'm and not going to no let bag. the Artist out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> so, get your own cup of cocoa or cocoa, and we'll be right back. Living with high cost of fuel, to be specific, petrol. How much did you get fuel the last time? Well, some people don't know yet. They haven't experienced it, so they are still in the process of. Um, what do we, what do we say? Now? She's in the. When well, you just got get join a company, what do you say? Here? She's in an induction process. She's been away for too long. <laughs> <laughs> She's been inducted into She's the purchase inducted. of fuel at uh, nine hundred naira. Oh, you know the price. I know it was uh, on the news. Oh, okay. Well, and I saw queues this morning. It's actually more than 900 SM, FYI. And oh. we have also been hinted that um, the one we are buying at 900 or whatever Naira now is not at the same quality level with the one that Dangote has um, produced. So, because the quality is higher, it's going to be more expensive. I didn't say that. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just extrapolating from what <laughs> you said. But that is a bit tricky to understand because Dangote is uh, refined here in Lekki. Yes. The crude that went into his uh, refinery was sold to him in Naira, not in dollars. But at the same value. Go on, go on. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So, uh, where were we? Um, you are aware, or you are not unaware, that the NNPCL said that financial constraints are hampering it um, from mm. importing petrol. And barely 44, 20, 48 hours later, hundreds of communities joined a line stretching many kilometers mm. for fuel. I don't know how long those queues are in other parts of the country, but in Lagos, quite a length. So last month, the same NNPCL announced a record $1.9 billion in profits for 2023. I said welcome. You are owing and you are announcing profits. I said welcome back. I'm not an accountant. <laughs> you will okay. understand it better, right? Well, fortunately, we have a financial analyst in the house okay. who I'm sure he'll be able to explain all that to us. Mm -hmm. Maybe so, there are some principles in accounting and in economics that allow all that. So who is this accounting? Ah. He's not an accountant. He's a financial analyst. Whether he's at a, there are plenty in that mm. space. Okay, he will analyze it for <laughs> us then. Um, Mr. Abubakar Omar, good morning. Good morning. Um, good morning. So the, sorry, the questions are already on you. But you have to just <laughs> wait a minute for us to introduce the other guests. We also have with us the Executive Director, Center for Sustainable Mobility and Development, Dr. Kaade Okwefa. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Good morning. And joining us from Abuja, Executive Director, Make a Difference Initiative. Ah, we'd like you to make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Lemi Uregbe, thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. I oh, know your questions. Uh -huh. <laughs> Mr. Omar, I'm sure you heard all the, well, I don't know how to describe it. The uh, hula our introduction. Yeah. So, no, he called it hula balloon. <laughs> <laughs> I heard him. <laughs> so, NNPC is declaring profit, and at the same time, it is saying it is owing, was it six billion? Yeah, yeah. It Something does. like that? Yeah, it doesn't give space. So, how do you declare profit when you are owing? I thought that you declared profit after you have paid all your debts and everything, all your expenses, and then what is left over is what is called profit. Yeah. That, that, but that, then, I'm not an economist. Of course. <laughs> and I'm not an accountant. So, 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 so we, we, you can say this in intersection of the two. Uh, you know, as, as somebody who is a layman, of course, if you say profit, you are expecting you know, to have the money with you. But that's not the case. That's rule number one. If, if a company declares profit, it means, you know, the money they have cash with them and the money they have with their debtors. You know, those people that did not pay you, you are outstanding. And if you ask who are those people, I will say it's the federal government. And why is that? It will be a case of, I am giving you my product below the cost price, below the selling price. 
I supposed to, you know, sold this product out at 1,200, you know, but then I'm selling it around 600. So it means there is shortfall. And that shortfall, I'm keeping it as, you know, as to the federal government as a debtor. So the reason is that they will declare profit if the federal government, you know, has paid them the subsidy amount. But of course, the federal government is illiquid. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so it means you are now producing at half the cost. So of it's, course, it's you have man. profit. You are confusing us more. <laughs> federal more. government, <laughs> NMPCL. <laughs> what is the difference? You know, it does, does, does another thing, of ah. course. That's another thing. That's why they said, uh, you know, NMPC is actually, you know, a private company. But then, it's a private company owned by government. So it's technically the same thing. It's a it's a profit making public company. Don't call it private company. First, some people will come back. From <laughs> <laughs> it's a corporation. So, it's one of those corporations of, of yeah, government. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that, that there's something we call you know substance over the legal. On legal, there are two different things. But when you look at the substance, it's the same thing because the presidency makes the ultimate decision. Mm -hmm. Since NMPC cannot decide to say we want to sell that fuel at one two, of course the government will say, I know you are going to create economic crisis, so sell it at that level. But then. If there today. is already economic crisis. So, so there will be more if, if they are not allowed to sell at the price they are going to sell. We are going to come back here to discuss in the next six months that 900 or 1,000 is not the actual price. And, and, that's and it's going to go up again. And it's going to go up again. So, so, so we, have a we, have a tough, we have a tough situation at our hands. <laughs> so, so I think that's the, that's the case. Hmm. So we will say the substance is the same, is the same thing. <sighs> And then you know on the on, on the on the legal side you have NMPC and the company which is almost under two different things. So the reason is that they will declare profit but they don't have the cash. That's just it because they have been selling off. And this is also the reason that exacerbated their own uh, press release where they said it's because of cash that they are unable to supply you know the product to the market. I'm still, I'm still confused. So, <laughs> You declare profit and don't have the cash. I don't even want to go there. We want to talk about living with high cost of fuel. <laughs> well, Dr. Kwefa. Good morning. Um, I'm not going to ask you an accountancy question. <laughs> so, but if you can venture, you can. However, I'll try. Um, the whole conversation around living with high cost of fuel, the challenge, as we established earlier, is that the federal government hasn't really done a good enough job of communicating with the people, giving people the awareness, educating people about the challenges that they have to contend with. They are there. They've been there for years. Tough decisions, according to the president, have to be taken. But you don't, don't just... A woman that is going to, you know, encounter labor pains knew nine months before that there was going to be, there were going to be labor pains. But we are experiencing these labor pains all of a sudden without any education. Uh, good morning. L let me say that uh, uh, this is quite uh, uh, not a pleasant situation. And uh, uh, we have to see the issue as it is. And uh, I also feel, personally, I feel the situation and I know a lot of people feel even much more the pain, better than some of us who have uh, options. Some people have no option. But the truth be told, we are aware from May 2019 that first subsidy will disappear. Either on the 30th of May or some day after. But me, Let me Dr. Kwesa, nobody warned us what that's where I'm going. That's where the I'm effect going. was that's going, going that's to be. I'm going to take some responsibility. Okay. And I'll push some to whoever I think uh, will not fight me. <laughs> we are also aware from 2011 that one day for subsidy we go. So on 2012, January 1 or so, the Jonathan government came up and said for subsidy is going to go. Nigeria resisted it and the government moderated the pump price. So swift subsidy in this case in Nigeria, I will equate it to pump price. That's the understanding of the general public. Mm. Now, along the line, Buhari government attempted it in uh, 2006, I think June or July, mm. when we changed the world from the regulation to liberalization. When it moved from 97 to 145, the calculation then was that it was going to go to like 133. Nobody complained. You know why? Because Nigerians 
felt it is time for this monster to disappear. I'm raising that just to let us know that we are all aware that one day, one day, this thing will happen. However, the issue is the implication did not come down to many of us, but some of us know. I've been on this seat, on this channel, a many channels, and many, I've been with him too, on yeah. channels on the other side, and these are the same top. And we raised it at that day, that this system, we have to let Nigerians know the truth. The cost of land, the co landing cost of oil is not the price we are paying. And the government from the books shows that that system is not sustainable. But we will bear the brunt. Nobody is ready to discuss. All I am concerned is, hey, me, I want to buy Korea for a What you are concerned, I don't want to buy Gary at high price. But if you go to the president's speech, I'm defending the president here, just because that's a fact. May 29, June 12, July 31st, October 1, May, October, uh, December, January 1st, 2023. In all the speeches, the president very clear, we are taking tough choices. These choices are not going to come easy. There will be some pain. But the, I, it, it, Let it, me learn, I am aware hmm. and will do everything. Now, when the subsidy was removed, immediately the price changed. Then when the forex was liberalized, mm. the price jumped. Then when it was, when the forest went from 800 was 90, it dropped. then the presidency says, no, we cannot afford this fluctuation. Unfortunately, that's what the PIA envisaged, that it will be adjusting with certain forces. I don't want to use market forces. So what I'm <laughs> trying to say here is this, this is the reality. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Uregbe, um, you have also, you are, I don't know how much you get fuel in Abuja, but I, I understand that it's quite, you know, something as well. What is your take on all of this? Let's begin from there. Yeah, good morning. Thanks for having me again. Um, it is really difficult. In Abuja, the price ranges, uh, uh, you, I, I was able to drive into a, a petrol station this morning and um, I bought at 940 Naira per liter to be able to get to the studio. Uh, there was no queue there, but you would find that there is unbelievable uh, level of queue in all NMPC petrol stations across Abuja. So it's, um, we must trace it. There are government policies that have actually caused this uh, cost of living crisis, including the policy on fuel subsidy removal. And as you know, uh, there is really a phantom removal because we realized uh, I was one of the first sets of people who kept mentioning clearly that, look, if we go by how much fuel is being sold at the international market, compared to what we are buying it in, in petrol station, it's obvious that government is still subsidizing fuel uh, price. However, where the problem really lies is the fact that government removed this. Under the PIA Act, the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation Limited is meant to be a limited liability company, a public company, and it's meant to be unshackled. It's meant to do business and make profits. Uh, with the president's inaugural speech where he declared subsidy gone, and of course we must take cognizance of the fact that that subsidy removal was actually done by the budget pass, uh, presented by the Muhammad Buhari administration. So he really wasn't the one who removed it, but, the moment, uh, but that subsidy uh, was supposed to run up to end of June. But the moment he announced it on May 29, 2023, Nigeria, if all petrol stations immediately adjusted and Nigerians lost even the one month breather they were to have. Now, NMPC Limited, we should be selling at whatever cost it bought based on the PIA remains shackled. So the president now and the minders now put the burden of paying the subsidy which they decided to use a new name for called shortfall. So they paid the margin between the cost of landing 
fuel and getting it to the petrol station. The Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation Limited pays that, which is still paying for subsidy. But this time, the federal government, which should be responsible for paying this subsidy, puts that burden on N NNPC Limited to pay. Now, that is part of the uh, outstanding debt that NNPC Limited is talking about. And we must be clear about this, that even when I had the earlier conversation, the opening conversation between both of you, and I saw, I saw that we are talking about the quality of fuel. That's why it's selling at this price. I can still tell you that it is still at the level of subsidies, not the quality of fuel. Uh, realistically, as sad as it is, we are in for a very excruciating ride. It's going to increase. It's going to go more, except government sits back, looks at the policy. The attendant problem of fuel crisis in Abuja now, a, a, a transport, a movement that you should use 500 naira for, you use 1,000 naira for. That is 100% increase in the cost of living. And this definitely, if it affects transportation, are, are you sure, affect, Doctor? We affect medical. Are you sure, Doctor Uhegbe, that it's just 100%? Because um, the, the fuel price, well, I don't know, I don't even know, you know. How, anyway, the, the source of our, the fulcrum of our conversation is how do people manage? But you are, I mean, it's not out of place to talk about what government interventions can help to achieve. Um, so what are the things that you would suggest? I am aware, I mean, I think I've mentioned it here before on this program, and a number of, of us are also aware, and I hope Alero is also aware, that there was a monarch in this country, somewhere in the southwest, that put out emissaries and said, people are extorting other people. Let them reduce the cost of their products and that he even abolished all trade unions in the markets because they were the ones who are forming some kind of oligarchy to increase prices. FCCPC is also, you know, crying foul about the fact that people are price gouging. Uh, we also know that even in Lagos State, there are some people who go around from market to market and say, how much is this thing? No, 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 reduce it by X percentage. And the people had to comply. Otherwise, they lost their stalls. Do you see any intervention that can come from state governments, knowing that the realities that people have to deal with is right there in their faces? We know. I mean, as uh, Dr. Kwefa has said, as you have also said, the realities are there. So is there any intervention that can come to make life easier, life easier for people? Okay, clearly... The increase uh, in the fuel price now, it's not even 50%. So, but we are having people pay transport by 100% or more, which suggests really that even us as Nigerians, we have our own problems. We are vicariously liable for what happens. Yes, government policies may have made things difficult, but Nigerians themselves, they say in the pedagogue of the oppressed, they say the oppressed in this oppression wants to be an oppressor. So all of us must really have a rethink. We must mm -hmm. have a change of heart. Uh, there are really very exploitative tendencies because if you go to the market and the person is telling you this particular product is selling for, let's say, 1,005, and you say, but the cost of buying this product getting it to the market is about 800 and the person says but i'm going to go and buy fuel and i'm going to buy other things too so we need to have a behavioral change communication strategy amongst the people and that means government would need to empower you know behavior change communication experts empower civil society at least when i say empower create an atmosphere where we really must begin to give out information and narratives where we persuade the people to actually begin to think humanity. Now it's dog eat dog. People are really very, 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 very unconscionable now they do the things they do. But we must continually talk. Education is the best vaccine. Uh, we must go. Monarchs are taking their steps. Governments are taking their steps. Well, you know what? It is just persuasion because it's a free market economy. Uh, there is a limit to how you determine price for people. So it's advocacy, it's mediation, it's continually going into their faces and telling them 
what is to be done, what is not to be done. And FCCPC and National Orientation Agency should lead this because they have offices spread across the country. But above all, the television stations themselves, the media itself, must also begin to uh, release a few, you know, little, little interview um, um, adverts persuading the people not to make life difficult for their fellow human beings. Nigerians are in dire straits. If you can put a 100, 200 Naira profit on your product, you will survive and the next Nigerian will survive. So our problem is beyond government policy. It also involves you and I, the way we think, the way we do things. Uh, where is the place of humanity? We are a people, we used to be a people with a lot of good conscience, but now it's like everyone is afraid of the next minute. So we In just must words, continually talk to people. We are our people. own problems. You don't agree. <laughs> I don't agree entirely. Okay. <laughs> Make your comment before I ask you your question. Then. <laughs> you know, you know uh, I, will, I will add an example uh, with the recent, I think, conviction that the AFCC did in relation to, you know, spraying the uh, Naira not. When that happens, you know, the atmosphere changes. Even from the people who used to see spray in era, they are now being cautious. So those are the kind of things that the government should be doing to be setting examples. When you, you know, convict, uh, you know, serious person, they go, everybody will now come back to his senses that, yes, the government is serious, they can do that. So I used to believe that if, if, you, set the to if you set the pace at the leadership, the, the followers will just, you know, take life. So okay. this is... <laughs> Now, I want you to remove your cap now as financial <laughs> analyst. You are now a Nigerian. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you are aware that uh, 70,000 Naira was approved as minimum wage. Yeah. With this latest increase in the price of fuel, how do you envisage that a worker who earns 70,000 Naira is going to survive? seeing as he will spend about forty or 50,000 of it on transportation to get to work. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that, that 70,000 Naira, it's so unfortunate that it's supposed to be there even before the increase. Which but some, by the way, which some <laughs> governments haven't even agreed to haven't pay. Haven't even agreed to pay. That, that's it. So I think there is a mismatch between the government awareness and, and the other side. You know, it's a two-stick carrot and, you know, so the government is putting out uh, policies that are hardship, but they are not, you know, uh, corresponding it with other policies that are beneficial to the masses. You, you can increase fuel in a single day, but it is difficult for you to, you know, implement the minimum wage. So sometimes, you know, to show good faith, you can even increase the minimum wage before, you know, increasing the parole price. So, but the citizens will always, it's so difficult now to explain to an ordinary Nigerian that these things are necessary. Because when you begin to explain, they will tell you, why is the president buying jet? And you don't have anything to say. <laughs> these are facts on ground. So it's so difficult to have a conversation. So, but the government is not helping itself in, in that optics part. It's supposed to, uh, to do, uh, you know, what we call to, to assist the public force. Okay, you put minimum wage 70,000. After the fall is 70, you now move it. Minimum, even if it is 200,000 now, I doubt if it will be enough for survival. Yeah. But, but minimum wage is not, uh, you know, a comfortable living wage. You know, it's something they call minimum. So if it is uh, 200, at least we believe other people can get 300 mm -hmm. and, uh, and the rest. So the, okay. the situation is uh, the government need to, you know, be forthcoming on dishing out policies. And, and I will say being intentional about that. For instance, you just we have been discussing CMG since last year and up to now I, I doubt if forget it is. that CMG thing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's available at what cost? So you see so, so you are not talking again. You are not uh, so you see and, and, and secondly, you even say that they will give is it thirty percent or thirty five to workers, you know, for since last year. I don't think that is materialized. They paid is it second or two or three times and that's the end. So you realize that whatever they say they will do to help people it is taking longer time. But then whenever they want to increase price, you know, or do this policy, it comes in less than 24 hours. So it's difficult to explain to somebody that the government is really working for their own benefit. It's difficult okay. to explain to somebody that you will enjoy in the long term because you are not giving me the short term, uh, you know, evidence to be sure that in the long term we are also going to That's a enjoy. Question. You also understand that any increase in the price of fuel will affect the price of everything else. 
because almost everybody, one way or another, has to use fuel. The farmer has to use fuel to get his goods from the farm to the market. You will need to, to farm. <laughs> <laughs> you want to farm, so, they use tractors. It's like government yeah. is always putting the cart before the horse. When subsidy removal was announced May 29th, they were going to do this, they were going to do that, they were going to do this and that and that. But there's no evidence that these things are being done. And they were supposed to have been done before the removal so that it would cushion the effect on the people. Which makes people believe that this government does not care about the people. The president is buying a plane, he's buying a yacht, 21 billion is spent on the uh, vice president's house, and people are being told to tighten their belts. The people are getting, they're getting disillusioned, they're getting despondent. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I understand the direction of the question. And, uh, but let me quickly address this issue of uh, um, the cost of uh, the difference is about 50%. And uh, in 2012, when this situation happened, I've said it many times, I've documented it, I've sent it to those who care. We need to call out the state governors. We did it in Lagos. The first thing the government should do, you know, we're all looking at federal. When, fed when these decisions come, there are different levels of effect. Every state governor should call out his commissioner for transportation and tell them to get out, get on their jeans, roll up their sleeves, and sit down with the transporters. The increase is 50%. It does not translate to 50% per head when you pick a 14 or three or four people in your vehicle. It translates to 28 to 30% per individual. We've done this in Lagos before. Does it also calculate the length of time they spend no, I'm, I'm the sorry. No, sorry. No, no. Forget okay. it. We're going to address the issue of... There shouldn't be scarcity. That's an aberration. So you don't base your calculation on, uh, 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 you correct aberration. Normally when the price, pump price change, the queue is supposed to disappear. That's what is expected. This is an unusual situation where the queue persists after uh, an up increase. increase in price. So we need to address <laughs> that issue. And I have interrogated. You are, you are yeah, yeah. I, I think the, the scarcity is just lack of supply. It's lack of in supply. The, in the yeah, we're coming in. So it's, it's a lack of supply. It's an intended <laughs> lack of supply. Intended. I will tell you, NNPC made it clear there is liquidity issue. He mentioned it, forex issue. They can't bring in that. Enough. You know, we need to read deep into every statement. So there is a shortfall of supply. Mm -hmm. So it's a supply and uh, 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 demand issue. Let's leave that. Okay, that there's demand and there's no supply. Days. This will disappear in a few days now. Now that they have assured us that there is now adequate supply. Now let me go to that. So what the government should do at every state. We did it in Lagos in 2012, after that uh, 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 97 to, no, was it 65 to 97? And we made all the transporters to get back to not more than 30% increase on fear. We took them to the water side for discussion in the evening with a three-course meal, and we brought our figures to show them these are the facts. So what they should do, I said this before, we didn't do it the last time when the, the government says something was more. Now they should, it's not too late. It has happened just about a week. Get all the commissioners for transportation to call the transporters and people involved in moving goods and persons to sit down. This is regulated regulation. Hey guys, come. How can you go to 100% decrease? This thing has gone 50%. You carry 14 people. They are reasonable people. Just like you mentioned about the monarch. That will come down. That's number one. Not that it will come down uh, um, um, totally, right. Totally, but there will be a substantial reduction. Okay. I can assure you that. Now, number two, when this thing happened, we always assume that it should be foretold. No, it's not going to be foretold. Not every issue, just reacting to you, will be foretold. Uh, policies are those that will take up immediately. Those are on the issue of alternatives. The government said there will be. CNG, right? Yeah. There will be alternative energy. On the CNG issue, I have a relationship with them. I'm disclosing it here. And I can tell you, just um, Tuesday, a transport company in Lagos, on the Lake Hages, got 20 buses from that scheme. Uh, proud to that, Pace Transport, or your state mass transit company, 
got 20 buses. Now the buses have started rolling out. Like I told you the last time, it's not on the shelf. Now, people are already doing conversion. I know of a colleague of yours who did a documentary, a report on NTA to show that she had converted to CNG and she had made CV. No, I'm just trying to address the issue that. Please kindly advise us. Mm. What would it cost us to convert our vehicles? I can't see of it, but I'm hearing figures. Approximately. No, so I'm hearing figures like 600 to 1.2 million, depending, <laughs> depending on the vehicle you are using. <laughs> now, it's an option. That it's can't not, be called no, cheap. everybody don't have to convert. I'm going to convert my vehicle within the next uh, five, seven days. Now, government have said they will convert. For now, they are converting public transport vehicles free of charge. Because those are the ones that impacted or that will impact much more people. Not converting me as you. I mean, <laughs> public transport vehicles. Now, Oku State government has converted all the mass transit buses mm. under its fleet to CNG. I know the state government that has bought electricity, electric vehicles. So what I say is not it's not going to be fair to say all that government promise mm. has not been done. A lot has been done. But like he said, there are not things that will take off with immediate effect. As far as I'm concerned, mm. what we need to be doing now is to government should find a quicker way, <laughs> something that is quick to quickly address the situation. The problem One, the scarcity should disappear. Yeah. Two, yeah, the pricing. The, mm. the pricing already at 800, like uh, he said from uh, uh, on the other side, the prices, like he said, is not still the landing cost. So government is already making some intervention. With that intervention- In other words, it's going to go up again. That, no, 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 you, I can't say that. <laughs> that intervention, is it adequate for the common man? So for the common people, we need to heavily now. It's not an option now. Is a must. State government must go straight into public transport system. Okay. Yeah. So well, that much more I, people I, let, will get let, out of the mission. Let's take some comments. Um, Otunse one says tough choices. Tough choice is prosecution of those involved in high profile crude theft. Don't ask me that question again. <laughs> those involved in the fuel subsidy scam, reform of corrupt petroleum sector that has not added value to the nation. These are tough choices not subsidy removal. That's from Otunse. Festus Akimboyewa says, though this rapidly increasing price of fuel is another hammer blow for Nigerians, Nigerians must prioritize protecting their own mental and physical health yeah. as the rapidly increasing price of fuel and other basic needs can make physical and mental health <laughs> worse. Yeah. Well, this one, uh, Dr. Uhegbe, is your question. Cost to market in Nigeria goes beyond fuel prices. The different extortion that people have also increased their charges from the police on the road to the ag barrels and so on. The cost, they are cost to the market. They are cost to the market people. How do you respond to that? Yeah. Uh I think we've even spoken already about this earlier in my opening statement. But just before then, um, I need to uh, react a little to what the other guests have said. Um, there's an attempt to renew our hope by suggesting what uh, state governors and co should do. Now, this is exactly uh, what we say, that we put the the uh, cat before the horse. The president ought to have sat on the seat as president and taking even one year breather to plan all of these alternatives and make sure they are in place. We are in, if the president is in government and the governors and everybody to rule over living, not to rule over the dead, and not to rule over people who are living but in distress. So this ought to all have been done before now. We, when he removed subsidy, he announced that uh, CNG buses were going to flood the country about, uh, was it 3,000, he said, in under six months. We are well over one year now, and this is when we are talking about supplies to these states and that. I joined my, I aligned myself with what Dr. Bayefa said in terms of state governors and co. They too must take responsibility. They are making a lot more money now from federal allocation. So we must hold them accountable. And that's why, and that trickles down to the third tier of government, the local government. 
if governors themselves will allow proper elections that will reflect the wishes of the people at the local government. So yes, beyond transportation, uh, the cost uh, of uh, pro commodities through transportation, there are a lot more concerns and all. But the point being made here is that genuinely, many traders too are exploiting the situation. They're exploiting the situation to get their prices at cut, uh, to put their prices at cut uh, truth uh, level. So we must admit to these facts. And we all in our small corners must continue to talk about this. The FCCPC's work is well cut out. But remember, we're also in a democracy. There's a limit to how you can also compel people. But Dr. Berfa gave an example of how this is done in Lagos. And this is the kind of responsibility governors, monarchs, everybody must be involved in. Let's come to a round table and have the uncomfortable conversation. If there is a fuel increase of marginally 50% or a little less, you should never, for all intents and purposes, begin to charge 100% increase. And to that extent, it is more of advocacy, it's more of public enlightenment. Nothing else will work because you did not procure these products. I don't which, know which how is, you are Which is one of the things, Dr. Hegbe, that doesn't really happen. That public awareness. I, I know you want to take a minute, but let me just... Yes. Uh, there's yeah. a, this is a, a response to you, um, uh, Mr. Umar. says, um, uh, thanks to Channel TV for your people-oriented programs. On the issue of NNPC declaring profit without monetary backing, we are confused as limit. I think they, they wait, wait. <laughs> well, he's coming somewhere. Okay, okay. This is Chris. He says, <laughs> if the money is not there, where do the ones shared by the three tiers of government at their monthly meetings come from? It keeps increasing any moment the petrol price increases. I'm asking as a layman. Yeah, I think I think maybe initial my initial explanation sound a bit more technical, but I think the simple answer will be the profit is consumed by the subsidy. I think that will be the simple. There is profit and then subsidy payment consume it. And you will ask me, the government has been denying their resource, no the subsidy, but that's their own denial. They changed the name to under recovery or is it short for? Short, short so, so, so that's, yeah, I think that's form. a simple explanation. The, the profit is consumed by the subsidy payment. So, and then for his question that where is the, you know, the money mm, in fact, mm. the money is basically coming not only from NMPC numbers. There are numbers coming from CIT, from VAT, if you check, uh, especially when they do that devaluation high amount of uh, money comes from exchange difference. So when you look at the fact numbers month by month, you realize that NMPC numbers is not, I think, the major contributing factor to that number. So that's one. And secondly, what doctor said, I want to say that uh, about marketers, you know, if you increase price and you expect them not to increase 100%, the, the biggest, you know, elephant in the room is the Naira devaluation. 10 Naira, 5 Naira, 20 Naira, even 50 is technically you know, almost gone in the economy. That's so you are saying, so you are saying if a transport is 100 Naira to place, you are expecting them to increase 30 Naira. How practical is that? How will they pay the 30 that, that's, 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 that's the problem. That's why it's easier for them if it is 100, they just push it to 150. If, that, if, even, yeah, if they have some empathy, then they make it 150. Otherwise, they make it 200. 200. So that's, yeah. that's, the, Doctor, that's one of the... there is a comment here from uh, Tunji Kolawole, and he says, vehicle owners should be advised to learn of engine capacity as it relates to fuel consumption. Such knowledge is the reason why fuel, uh, fuel, guzzlers, fuel guzzler SUVs are rarely seen on the streets of London and other European cities. The higher the engine capacity, the higher the fuel consumption. New vehicle buyers should go for lower capacity engines in the range of 1.2 to 2 liters, and existing owners may consider downsizing <laughs> to smaller cars. Absolutely, it's correct. Ah. Yeah, it's correct. I'm Wait. not talking of downsizing. I'm talking of the, the uh, engine capacity. So here is someone who is having a problem getting around. You're asking him to go and get by on that car. No, no, I'm not responding to that. I'm responding <laughs> absolutely to the issue of your engine capacity. Get, getting smaller, you know, cars with smaller engines. It. When you want to buy a Prado, let's, I, I'm going for the IN now. <coughs> there, are, there are four v, uh, V4, V6, V8. V8. If you buy V4, 
Nobody knows it is not V8. Except that they rent it at the back. You spend less on consumption. On, then there are some fuel. vehicle brands that are low uh, um, uh, for consumption. Consumption mm. vehicles. I, 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 sorry, I'm, I'm going to say this and I'll call it. I was once in government and we are told that we'll get a brand of Camry as official car. And the reserve car will come two years after and that will be a Corolla. Yeah. But they told us the engine capacity of the Camry, no more than 2.0. And that was when I got to understand that the 3.0 Camry or 2.8. So everybody got 2.0. One, 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 as they say, one that there was, there is 1.8. It's four liters so of what petrol. Has, what this person has said, these are things, these are some of the, um, uh, how people can manage this situation. So For you example, are, you are definitely you, you not also... You are definitely, I'm sorry, you are definitely not talking to a tomato seller. Emmanuel says tomatoes that went up to 60% Thousand naira dropped to in to normal when citizens found a substitute in watermelon. That's not true. <laughs> this that's not true. You see, this is coming from Iowa. Yeah, it came down because of uh, uh, is a seasonal issue. That's not the one, yeah. and uh, people don't understand it. And we need to start educating people. I used to see my wife stock the fridge with boxes of tomato when I was in the US. And I just think this one, I just wasted my money. <laughs> Until <laughs> the Nigerian situation started some years ago. And she reminded me that even in America, all over the world, yes. there are some products that are seasonal. But guess yeah. what? She doesn't buy tomatoes any longer. Just from three tomato planted, she gets enough to cook. Now, what made that price to come down has to do with it's farming right. and seasonal issues. And these are other things that we also need. And it happens to all See, it goes back to the thing that we had said. Uh, but the question is educating, mm -hmm. educating Nigerians about these things. If you don't give Nigerians information, we will fill in the gaps. Yeah. What is the First Lady's initiative? Uh, that backyard farm. Backyard, yes, I, I don't it. buy uh, a wedu any longer. Uh, what do you call a wedu in Nigeria? A wedu in Nigeria. Crane, crane. <laughs> Whatever uh, that means. That anyway, this that is Sonny Ehigiato e e e who says, so, good morning. So good to have you again, Madam Alero. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> why is it that when the issue of subsidy is being discussed, we don't talk about why the Nigerian refinery is not working? If 2011, we knew that one day this subsidy will be removed, why won't the refinery get working? This is why we are angry I, but listen I, to uh, please don't we are talking about I, how, why, how how we can live with this yeah, yeah, yeah. don't analyze an NPC, please. It's, it's making people no, but, but no, just, no, no, just one moment before you go to the next uh what's comments. the name of this person the, the um a, a, a higiato uh -huh. a higiato Remember that the NMPC uh, MD told us that Potakot refinery would start working soon. August. Well, okay, he said August 1st, and then he's pushed it to September. We are in September now, so we are hoping that before the end of this month, the Potakot refinery will start working, mm. and we will see the effect on our lives. Okay. I say my, but my, <laughs> my, for my <laughs> mental health, I'll put it at December. Tunde Arogumati says, the core <laughs> issue that's not been addressed is a corruption-ridden petroleum industry that has been repurposed from a national asset into a channel for self-serving enrichment of a privileged few. So the to the detriment of the distorted economy and well-being of every single citizen. Professor Enakena says, federal government must completely deregulate the petroleum sector and must stop shortfall payments. Hmm. Oh. Prof, you have aligned. Oh. Oh. That replaced subsidy payments. Texas has 32 operating oil refineries with annual budget of $321.3 billion, meaning the federal government must diversify the economy from over-dependence on crude, yeah. stabilize power to bring down the prices of goods and services. Yeah. Now, let me... Okay, you want to say... Yeah, I want to say something about this refinery. I think, you see, a lot of times uh, there is that misconception that is more popular than the reality. Uh, and it oftentimes dash the hope of Nigerians. For instance, now, people expect if Dangote refinery is on stream, price will go low. You see, this is a misconception. People expect even if the four refineries in the country is working, price will go low. You see, that's also a misconception. So these are the things that people believe if our four refineries are working the price, there is no relationship between having a lot of refineries and low 
and low prices to the ex so the problem is our economic is our purchasing power it goes that, back to that's lack that's of education you educate that's nigerians that's people will know what to expect but mr Awa, um i have to play devil's advocate here yeah if dangote um fuel is in the market cost of freight is removed cost of uh, duties and all that those all those costs are removed why shouldn't that affect the cost i'm paying at the pump because the costs are not materially significant that's just the answer you can they are not materially even if it is one cobble i want to feel uh, it when uh, i go well, to the you, pump yeah of course if it is maybe one cobble but if you are buying fuel 900 and they say it turns to 840 or 830 i don't think uh, people will be happy or they will appreciate that amount of decrease i think that's that's just the argument the amount is not materially significant as compared to you know when they are importing because the product yeah, they, is they are, it's just logistic demorage fees the and, and all the global product <laughs> price in dollars so price so the the big uh, elephant in the room is the exchange rate, the I'm, exchange still, rate. I'm still <laughs> my, i'm still I'm, I'm i'm yet to understand the basis of that if we can walk if our economists can walk on the naira to dollar value hmm. if it comes down today Let's just as we come but, down to. But that's another mis. I don't think it's, no, 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 it's not working. No, it's export. You earn it. No, I, you I, I, earn okay, it. Sorry, sorry. Let me yes. change my word. Yo. Assuming <laughs> our economy works and and we earn more, we earn more dollars, dollars and our foreign reserves improves, <laughs> and then we can use the foreign reserves to defend the value of the naira. That's all. Like it did about January, February. It comes down yeah. to like one thousand two hundred. You will see these. Uh, is it eight forty or whatever now? Yeah, it will come go down, down to like six hundred. That's the way it works. Unfortunately, unfortunately, our foreign reserve is low, our export capacity is low, yeah. which is supposed to increase with the devaluation. But it's not happening because we are too import dependent. Okay. okay. Dr. Okay. Okay. We uh, only have less just over a minute. minute. So we need to close we need to close this program yes. now. Yeah. So we need to close your close uh, take your closing statements. So, Mr. Kwefa, let me start with you. We're talking about how to live with this high cost of fuel. What would be your advice to Nigerians? And that question is going to go around. So Nigerians, I believe they have been pushed that much. And my advice would be to government first. Government should look at ways that uh, programs and policies are in place. And those that are in place are made to work. We need to government in the area of uh, the current pricing, the issue of alternative energy, the CNG program, the electricity program, the solar program, must be ramped up, and there should be more investment on that program. The FCCPC and the NMDPRA, who are the regulators for pricing in this case, should be strengthened so that they can help fight all these gouging and the rest. Okay. And to the people, you have to make the appropriate choices. Try to reduce your dependence on petrol. <laughs> Dr. Levy. <laughs> well, uh, it's difficult, but let's just say that um, our concern is to advise government to be more sensitive to the needs of the people, for government to actually drop a lot of Eurocentric anti-people policies and bring into play measures that can actually renew the hope of the people. Because right now there is despondency in the land. Uh, for the people, we still say let's believe in our country, Nigeria, uh, as difficult as it is, we, we, we cannot lose hope totally. So there is a need, however, to, while saying tighten your seatbelt, the government itself must also begin to be more prudent in how they spend money. Uh, unnecessary spending, you preach to the people to be patient and you spend so much and you show opulence in the face of poverty ravaging the people. Yes. The people too, employers especially, must now begin to think of how to reduce the number of these workers come to work and they should some days they should work remotely because it is impossible on 70,000 Naira, mm -hmm. which governors are not willing to pay. Even at the federal uh, government level, they are not even paying it yet. It is impossible to pay transport and still have 20,000 naira in your pocket. Okay. So let's thank, thank uh, you. be our thank brother. Thank you, doctor. Mr. Omar. Yeah, so, so one thing, it's difficult to outshine a declining economy. 
and and also can you be nice <laughs> <laughs> no it, it's actually true even if you increase my salary now i still fall again to, to the, you know a very difficult uh, living standard. So that, that's what Mr. I mean. Mr. Omar, if your salary were increased, in, 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 increased to 5 million naira a month, you can't say that's not going to affect yeah, but you. But who will increase it to 5 million naira a month? <laughs> 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 so so, so that, that, that's it. And then it's, it, you say we advise Nigeria. I will say it's difficult to advise a hungry and angry man in the street. Mm -hmm. So I, I would will, I will rather advise the government. Uh, let them try to do something that will earn the trust I think, of I think, I think that advice is also what I know you want us to close <laughs> now. Akin says on X, Dr. Puefa, perhaps we haven't engaged with transport workers to understand costing. When fuel prices go up, not only fuel is affected, the union ex increase their levy, <coughs> the mechanics, the organizer also <laughs> increase <laughs> their maintenance oh. charge, and these are the issues. However, there is this advice that, as you have talked about government, um, Dr. Damola from Ota says, to alleviate the suffering of people, government, state and federal, must subsidize cost of food and transportation by whatever means, not ineffective palliatives. Thank you, Dr. Damola. Yeah. <sighs> Thank you very much, um, our panel this morning, starting with uh, Mr. Buba Kauma, a financial analyst, Dr. Kaede Okwaifa, Executive Director, Center for Sustainable Mobility and Development, and Dr. Lemi Ugebe, Executive Director, Make a Difference Initiative, who joined us from our studio in Abuja. Thank you very much for coming to share your insights with us this morning. Sunrise will be right back in a moment with another interesting conversation. Do stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. Now we have a group here called the Progressive NITEL and MTEL Pensioners Forum. And uh, they have come to lodge a complaint. And in these days of <laughs> high fuel costs and high food costs, High cost of living. High co generally high cost of living. I think that uh, government needs to listen to their plea. This forum comprises retired employees of NITEL and MTEL who are being owed hmm, 35 months of pension arrears despite repeated promises by the relevant authorities. Just to be clear, NITEL, NITEL died how many years ago? Um, is it, is it, or did it evolve? Well, the early 2000s, because the GSM came in 2000. Yeah. And very soon after, NITEL disappeared. And uh, MTEL was like the kind of... Um, the, the, the GSM section of, of NITEL. That's right. And that's how many decades ago now? Okay. <laughs> so you were saying something. <laughs> These pensioners say that the situation is dire, with many of their members having passed on due to lack of funds for medical care and others suffering from debilitating diseases unable to afford treatment. They have lost count of the number of funeral ceremonies that they have attended in recent months, all due to the non-payment of their legitimate entitlements. So representing that group this morning, it's my pleasure to welcome Chief Sunday Adejumo, Assistant Manager Transmission, Lagos Long Distance Communication. Thank you very Good much. Good morning. Madam. And he has come along with Mrs. Omobola Vaughn, Manager, Senior Private Secretary. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Ekundayo Ajibolua, Secretary to the Progressives, NITEL MTEL Forum. Good morning. Good morning, morning ma'am. And uh, joining us from our studio in Abuja is Mr. Godwin Alajemba, Manager Transmission Operations and Maintenance Division. Mr. Alajemba, thank you for joining us this morning. Let me begin with thank you, you uh, Mr. Adej Chief Adejo. Thank you very much. Okay, this thing has been going on for 35 months. That's almost three years. Have you had any interaction or communication with the authorities? And what have been the results of those discussions? First and foremost, ma'am, 
Good morning, my esteemed pensioners of NITEL and MTEL. Good morning, the Executive Secretary of uh, PTAD. Good morning, Dr. Ejikome. Good morning, the Coordinating Minister of Economy, Chief Wali Edun. And good morning to the worker friendly, pensioner friendly president, President Ahmed. That was Bolatinumbu. Uh, before I go into that question, ma, maybe we should understand where we're coming from, how we got to where we are. Actually, NITE was a beacon of uh, telecommunication industries some years back. It was inaugurated 1st January 1985. We had the P&T and we have the NET. The telecommunication department of the P&T was merged with the NET to form what was called NITED, 1st January 1985. Prior to that, ma, we all signed what was called Pension for Life. All of us, we signed Pension for Life. That's where we're coming from. And by 2006, precisely, uh, July 31st, 15,212 staff were disengaged from the service were cut off from our services, and uh, we were asked to go home to pave way for privatization policy. This policy uh, was uh, in the end to us, but we had no choice than to take it in good faith, thinking that that pension was going to come. All of a sudden, we were paid three and a half years initially. Another government came in and said these people were so changed. They were deprived of what we signed for, which was a pension for life. That government added another one and a half years, making five years. And that five years will last by 2011. Between 2011 and 2018, when we were verified by the PTAD, we have a, a, a period of interregnum, a period of inactive inactiveness. By 2018, the then president of the Federation, Major General Buhari Ritard, mandated the ESP TAD to verify, to verify all United staff. And this they did. We had about 15,212 employers or employees of uh, United, and uh, 9,712 were paroled later that year. Between 2011 and 2018, we had 84 months accrued pension arrears, which was outstanding. Seven years. Yes, but we were getting a monthly pension, which was a, a stipend, Stipends. and we thank God for sparing our life. Out of this, we made several plea to the president then, the president of uh, Mohammed Buhari, and he was able to settle 48 months in peacemeals in about five branches. And since this government came in, they have been able to settle only one month, leaving us with a balance of 35 months outstanding monthly pension. That is where we are coming from. So we are left, we have made several pleas. We have written, there have been promises, but the interesting thing is that they have not denied that they are not, we, have been, we are not being owed. Out of the 10 companies that were privatized, government-owned companies, like Delta Steel Alaja, Nikon, Reinsurance, Power Holding, Nigeria Waste, Nite and Ente, all of them have been settled fully, settled fully. But Nite is still outstanding, having been owed 35 months, only recently the Nigerian Meteorological Agency was paid 45 months at a swap. Okay. Mrs. But, Vaughan. Yeah. Why yes. Do, why do you think NITEL MTEL was singled out for this? Mm. Mm. Thank you. For reasons best known to me. We, <laughs> we don't know. That's why we are here pleading. <laughs> It's so painful. All orders have been paid except NITEL, MTEL, pensioners. 
and many of us are dying. We are all in our old age. It's not been easy for us at all. We are here because we need to cry loud to the president, to the finance minister, to please listen to us and hear us directly. We know this forum is a forum that he listens to. He will hear us and do the needful, help us with this, our outstanding 35 months on paid salaries. And also, there are some members, very, very sad, that we have verified along with us for the past five years plus that are yet to be bankrolled. It's so painful. I don't it, even know. I don't know. I don't even know where to begin. Um, oh, do you have any idea, Mr. Jibolua? Yeah, yeah. Mr. It's, 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 it's pathetic, really. I, for one, I'm representing the Nest, Nest of, of King, King. So we are sort of still involved in this. I mean, we have our parents. Uh, are sort of involved. Yeah. You are involved. We are, <laughs> we are fully involved. Yeah, oh, because you. I mean, you're looking at it. Many of them, people, many of the people I represent as the Nest of King, they have suffered a lot as mm. well. I, you, you think about uh, most of the things that happen is many of the uh, retirees, once they go out of service, uh, from my own research, I found out that almost 95% of them are affected by one debilitating disease or the other. I checked that because when my, my, my mother was, um, she was a member, she was a staff there when she was retired, I found out most of her friends, almost every one of them had one NCDs, that's non-communicable diseases, or the other. They were battling with that seriously. And that's still the case till today. Even on the platform I saw, there was still somebody's um, uh, wake up that was just, I think that's happened on Friday. Yes. People die daily. And now the question is, why was that single? That we can't say, and that's why I'm involved in this. I'm not just involved because I'm a nest of kin. It's not because of me. It is because I am concerned about these people. And I'm, I must say here, these are the the best of minds Nigeria and Bahab. I've been relating with them. I act as a secretary. You know, I'm not retired. I'm still <laughs> very active. But I, I found it very, I mean, difficult to believe that this set of minds, I mean, we can take them out of service, really, and then not pay them. You, you need to know. I, my, my mom died of um, breast cancer. I know of um, six of our friends that have died of the same thing. I have so many of them and, you know, the question is being asked, why and where? Who is the person in charge doing all of this? And that's why we've been, we've been doing all we can and I've been involved with that. I've been involved, fully involved with them. You see, the best of minds we have in Nigeria are just being left behind there and then, you know, okay. dying every day. Well, Mr. Lajemba, uh, I'd like to ask, you know, if you can give us any idea what reactions or responses have come from wherever because, I mean, from what Shifadejumo um, said, you know, it's not like nothing has been done. It just seems like some people are just being singled out. So, would you want to tell us what initiatives have been taken by the organization, particularly concerning these 35 months unpaid, and uh, what, if any, have been the responses? Thank you. We have an existing union members who actually have been following this thing bumper to bumper with the executive secretary of Petard. And uh, I want to give it to her. Yes, she has been really on the side of the Nigerian pensioners, I would say frankly. But I think she has shortfalls. Shortfalls in what form? The thing is that it's when money is allocated to her, made available to her, that she could use it to settle the pensioners. It's unfortunate that, as we speak, she does not have money to capture us yet. That our own matter is not uh, budgeted for. Now, what is the problem? The thing is that, agreed, the NITO pensioners, we are so large. We are close to it, to 10,000 or more. And the amount involved in settling us 
per month goes close to a billion. Now, the 35 months arrears they are owing us goes to, say, approximately about 28, 29 billion. So the government is seeing it as big money, huge money that if they bring it out once, could affect what they want to do for the larger population. So looking at it from their own angle, we'll see it with them. They need to make progress, yes. But they also need to consider that this is money we have worked already for. And as time goes, day goes by, this money keeps depreciating. You know, the value of the money yeah. keeps depreciating. Mm -hmm. Such that at the end of the day, you might realize that you find out that the 35 months as whole, when paid to somebody, might not be able to get him one room. Talk less of a room and parlor. Mm. The price was meant is how much now? A bag of rice is how much now? A liter of petrol is how much now? When this money was owed to us is how much? The value we can get much of these things to assist ourselves. But right now, it becomes very much, I would say, the, the words to use, it's so pathetic that we look at it that even if it is given to us, what can we get with it? But it's better given to us that we go and patch our life than being kept. Okay. We also feel for the government, yes. But okay. please, we beg on them. Yes, Chief Ajayi, there is a an email from Olani Yogundi yeah. who sent in the message from Ifo. Okay. You know, it says, when one hears something like this, is a heart touching issue. When those still in government see this kind of thing, it's a call for them to take care of themselves mm -hmm. while in in service because it's obvious that the Nigerian government won't take care of them after mm -hmm. service. Meanwhile. Politicians will serve just four years mm -hmm. and become billionaires in the same society. It's quite unfortunate. Now, how would you suggest? Because um, every civil servant has a minimum, a maximum 30, 35 years? 35 years. To serve in government. Yeah. Or by the time you attain the age of 60, 60 or 70. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, what would be your counsel? Because... Um, First of all, you are you are here to appeal. Yeah. Exactly, who are we appealing to right now? We are appealing to the Minister of uh, Finance, the Honourable Minister of Finance, and we are appealing to the President. The Executive Secretary of Pitad is uh, I am directed to. So if he's, she's directed to pay, she will pay. If the fund have made available to her, she will pay. But beyond that, uh, people have spoken. Our people are dying in scores. Many cannot afford the basic necessity of life. We cannot put food on the table. People are living with treatable sicknesses. The deaths are preventable. But because we cannot assess medical care, our people are dying. We are losing them in scores. We are losing them on a daily basis. People are dying. Pensioners are dying on a night ten. I'm ten pensioners are dying on a daily basis, and these are treatable sicknesses. These are preventable deaths. So that's why we have come here. We, we, we have what is called empathy. Three skills of empathy: hmm. the cognitive empathy, the emotional empathy, and the compassionate empathy. Okay. Well, Ms. Vaughan, um, if you had an opportunity to speak with the Senate, oh the House of Representatives, or even anyone else who has any influence, what would be your appeal to them? My appeal will be to have mercy on us. We are old. We cannot do any work, any business whatsoever. We, each and every one of us has one ailment or the other managing. And these days, it's not easy, it's not funny to buy drugs to manage yourself. They should please 
look into our matter and pay us. The president is the listening president. He has done well with Lagos State pensioners. He should do well with the federal pensioners as well. And we also thank the former president, which is still the same APC government. They should please do likewise and help us. We are the only pensioners that are yet to be paid fully. Mm. We beg the president to okay. please if, hear if, our call. Yeah. If we are to go by what Mr. Lajemba said, said on the average to take care of the your 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 class of pensioners, it will be about a billion naira every month. So thirty-five months will come to about thirty-five Ooh. billion naira. Yes. Right? It's a chicken fee. Ah. If it was chicken, they would have paid it too. <laughs> okay. But, <laughs> <laughs> but let me ask no, you, no, sir. Maybe, maybe, maybe I help you in that area. Okay. I, I told you that the previous government yeah. under the leadership of uh, Buari, they paid us forty eight months. They were not being paid once. It was paid in tranches. Four or five tranches. Some six, some eleven, some twelve some five months. Mm. Mm. So if this one, if we decide to break them down, maybe in six, six months, we have heard that from the executive secretary of Peter that she was going to be paying us randomly, maybe every four, four months, it was going to be paid six, six months. Mm. But those promises are not being kept. So leading me to the question to you, uh, Mr. Ajibolua, do you think government is aware? And let me decrypt government. I mean... Okay. Uh, Chief Ajitma just mentioned the PTAD secretary. Mm -hmm. um, he also mentioned the Minister, Minister of Finance, Finance. And we are calling on the president. Let's say the president is distracted too much. Yes, uh, do you think that the various levels or tiers of government are aware of this particular situation? Otherwise, I mean, just as you said, in one year, not much has been done in this particular matter. That is, that is quite significant. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the question that box everyone involved in this. Uh, you, 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 you think this is not something for something that is important. People are taking it very lightly. And I am sure very well that um, Peter and the executive secretary is aware of this and very much aware of this. 35 months is not a joke. Uh, I've seen communiques, I've seen messages being sent, and every time the same word is, is, is used, the same once phone is made available, that means they are aware of this. And that's the question if, I mean, when you say 28, uh, 38, um, 35 billion, or let's say 28 billion to settle this, uh, you, it comes to mind when you have people renovating, um, I mean, a building for just, um, 20 million, 20 billion, mm -hmm. and all that, and we can't pay for people and treating them like a spent force. And that's that calls to question uh, why people neglect their duties because I, that's the way I feel. I feel, I feel let down. I, for one, I, I'm, 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 I can't tell anybody, I can't even advise anybody to go into civil service. Yeah, because I was even doing that. While well, I saw the things my mom got as um, a parting gift, I told myself, is this where I'm going to work? And then I told myself, never would I do that. I won't. Because now you are limited. They are limited. And many of them, they can't even do anything much today. Mm. Mr. Lajemba, uh, this government has been there uh, just over a year. Um, what would you say to those who would say that this government is uh, going through a lot? As we always say in our lifestyle segments, you know, children go through a lot. This government is going through a lot, is facing a lot of issues, and the government's income is dwindling. Yeah, what I would say to the government is this. You know, having the right perspective to things, you cannot attack the whole thing at a go. Put prioritize things. When they want to say this, you know, the government is a continuous one. You inherited debts. Before entering, you already know these things were there. You need to attack to them. And 
when you attend to pensioners, they will continue to pray for you. They will continue to seek God's face on your behalf so that the government as a whole, the country as a whole, would have divine intervention. I want to point one thing, among all things we'll be saying. You know, the government is here new, just say one year plus. And the executive secretary retired was inherited from the other government. So possibility is there that when she will present the bill to settle us, coming to them with this large use sum, they could think that maybe from the blue, this woman is cooking up this uh, bill. And this is one of the things that made us to say, let's come out and speak. Probably, let them see that truly people are out there really needing this thing. Mm. And once the money is made available to the woman, we we'll believe that she would take care of it, pay it out to us. Not just us, but all the pensioners too waiting out there. Okay. Not just like for example, August now, some people yet are yet to receive their salaries, their pension. Why? There's no money. They say once money comes in, they will pay them. Please, these ones also should be taken care of. That we okay. wouldn't have lapses here and there. We 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 have to wind down now. So, Chief, um, how confident are you that this matter will be resolved soon? in light of all that is going on in the country now? Yeah, uh, first and foremost, let me take uh, what my brother said, that uh, going to, I mean, Nigeria is going through. We are part of Nigeria. We have used our youthful age to work for this country. We have, we have collectively contributed to the development of this country. So whatever the country is going through, let us let them carry us along so that we too will let be us, part. Let us go through it together. Let, let us go through it together. <laughs> So that we'll be part of it. We are not saying paying us everything at once. We, are, we, are, we, are, we know that the, the money is, is big. But the ESP Tad has promised that she was going to be paying in six, six months. I mean, six, six months in four, 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 four months like that uh, interval. Let her hold there to this promise. We are not holding that that she should pay us at once. If this matter has not gotten to where it's supposed to get to, let it get to where it's supposed to get mm -hmm. to. Let it get to the Honorable Minister of Finance. Let it get to the table of the President. Let them be aware. People are dying. We have come to beg for them to save our souls. Let them have compassionate on us. Well, I don't mean to be unfeeling, but um, you must be aware that some people who are in service do not get their salaries when their salaries are due. Hmm. That is also something else that is happening in our nation today. Well, it's, it's really unfortunate that, you know. It is unfortunate. We, we, we feel for you. We feel for you. You know, but why you come here now and say some other agencies of government have been paid all order, fully? All other. All other. And you have not been paid is a problem that you need to get to the bottom of. Definitely. And we pray that this will be resolved Amen. soon. Amen. So that you stop going to funerals and stop going Amen. to... Thank you. Mm. you know. Well, incidentally, beloved is on the same page with you. Nitel MTEL is the only inherited pension liability yet to be fully paid. All right. Uh, Every day that this money remains unpaid risks depriving aged pensioners of losing out on the fruit of their youthful struggles. Correct. They are old. Every day matters. Please let government pay them. Plus the fact that money is losing value every day. Every day. day. George yes. says these are people who served Nigeria. Now that they need their pension, government is finding it difficult to pay them. This same government has money to service bloated cabinet, buy private jets, and so on. Buy yachts. It's a pity. Well, <laughs> um, comments, comments, comments. Well, we wish you all the best and Thank we you. hope that this matter will be settled. Um, if not fully, at least government begins to show signs yes. by paying gradually 
so that you all will be out of this kind of hole that you're all in. Thank you very much for bringing, coming this morning to bring this to light. Thank Chief you. Sunday Adejuwa, Assistant Manager Transmission, Long Distance Communication. Mrs. Amobola Vaughan, Manager, a Senior Private Secretary. Mr. Ekundayo Ajibolua, Secretary to the Progressives NITEL and MTEL Forum, as well as Mr. Godwin Alajemba, Manager Transmission Operations and Maintenance Division, who joined us from our studio in Abuja. Thank you all very much. And we wish you all the best in this struggle to get your pensions paid. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you very, very, very much. much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Sunrise will return in just a moment. Do stay with us. <laughs> Oh, we just got done talking to seniors, so let's now talk to some juniors uh, because they will become seniors, and I know that their plight will not be like the one where, unfortunately, we just spoke about. Amen. Yeah. Amen to yeah, that. So, mm. <laughs> so Junior Achievement Nigeria, Jan, is a member of Junior Achievement Worldwide, and it delivers experiential hands-on programs on four core pillars, financial literacy, work readiness, entrepreneurship, and digital literacy to young people between ages 5 and 35. Wow, I wish I had a five-year-old. Is it people or girls, women? Young well, people generally. Well, young, young people. people. Well, don't mind the fact that the young people are being represented by just one gender here today. <laughs> okay. you know, don't mind that for now. Okay. Junior Achievement Nigeria's LEAD is an acronym for Leadership, Empowerment, Achievement, and Development. Let's get straight into the conversation this morning uh, with uh, the Program Marketing Manager of Junior Achievement Nigeria is here with us, Tobiloba Olaoshu. Thank you for joining us here. Thank you very much. No, don't worry. There will be no difference because we have with us here uh, Blessing Obaje, alumna of Lead Camp. Thank that you. is you. Good morning. But sitting beside Tobiloba and on this side is Abigail Mbio, who is 2024 Lead Camp participant. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, sir. Well, let me just mention, in case she told you that she was going to Channels Television, she's here, Patricia, Claire, <laughs> Iwewe, who is Head Citizenship and Sustainability of Union Bank. She told you she's coming here. She's here. But you may not see her. <laughs> I'm just saying. Before someone will say, ah, but she said she was going to tell <laughs> And we did not see her. We did not see her. <laughs> okay. Well, that out of there. So, Toby Loba, let's begin with you. This year's camp, uh, lead camp, marked how many years of its existence? Now? 23 years. Wow. So, the, tell us about the target audience and the impact of the program. Okay, Lead Camp, like you have mentioned, is leadership, empowerment, achievement, and development, and it's focused on only girls' gender. Mm -hmm. It's aimed at targeting, it's aimed at empowering about a thousand girls across Nigeria with beneficiaries and volunteers and teachers working with them. It's a hybrid program. And it's focused this is on the lead part. Yes, of it. this is the lead. Yes, okay. the lead is only for girls. Yes, it is. So okay. that's why I was speaking to the fact that that's for youth. Generally, Jan offers services to youth, youth. across Nigeria. Uh -huh. Well, lead camp is for girls only. So we reach out to about a thousand girls across Nigeria from different states in different schools, where we have a hybrid mode, where a number of them are in location and they engage with facilitators, thought leaders across different industry. We focus on their career, helping them to identify strength in being a leader, and also helping them to discover the impact of health and well-being in, in our world generally. Uh, 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 you, I introduced you as a marketing manager yes, of please. the program. So explain your role with Jan and maybe even your involvement with the lead camp. Okay, so I'm the marketing manager for Junior Achievement Nigeria. Oh, so you're the one that's been talking to Patricia? Yes, please. Okay. So Patricia, of course, is the representative with Union Bank, and Union Bank has sponsored Lead Camp for 10 years. Oh. Yeah, so this is the 10th year where they've sponsored, and basically my role is overseeing branding and marketing, 
and seeing that the publicity about all our programs is well reached to all all locations across Nigeria. Mm. Well, um, Blessing, you have um, participated before. Yeah. So, Shay, how long ago was that? I participated in Junior Achievement in 2017. 2017. Um, so, you're a senior. Yes, <laughs> I am. So, share your experience with the Lead Camp. Um, Lead Camp was a transformative experience for me. And some of my key takeaways include the importance of communication and the importance of networking and building meaningful connections. And also, I got to understand the, the value of mentorship and also discover my passion for sustainable development goals, especially those focused on education and gender equality. Mm. And how have you used that key takeaway in the past six, seven years? Um, it has had a profound impact on my personal and professional journey. Personally, it boosted Did I my... hear professional? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Personally, it boosted my confidence and, like I said earlier, helped me develop my passion for sustainable development goals for girls. And professionally, it has equipped me with essential skills in communication, leadership, and creative thinking, and has led me to my current role. Mm. Okay. Is that your experience as well? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, no, your experience must be unique to you. <laughs> yes, it's unique. Okay, tell us about it. Okay, my experience at Lead Camp this year was very empowering. So, because it really equipped me with priceless skills and knowledge about um, relationship, about leadership, um, entrepreneurship, etiquette, and also health. So that program has workshops and ability and activities that are so interesting that I can't believe what's so fun too. So during the activities, I gain a deeper understanding about myself. I learned about self-awareness. Then I also develop essential tools to navigate challenges. So let me just say, Lead Camp is a very exciting and interactive event. So it is a big opportunity for my learning, for my growth, and for my self-discovery. Mm -hmm. So after I left that program, I feel really inspired, motivated, and ready to show mm -hmm. positive impact. Wait, did you when, rehearse sorry. what you said? <laughs> yes. You rehearsed it? Yes, sir. Because ah. this is how you are reading the <laughs> scripts. <laughs> when was this camp? Um, it was, I think it's um, July, yeah. July, ending of July. Close to summer break. Okay. So you've been out of the camp now for how many weeks? Like About six weeks. Um, for like mm. a month. Okay. What now, do you intend to do with this knowledge that you've garnered at the camp? This knowledge that I've gathered from the camp, I really appreciate it because it teaches me so much with communication with people, how to speak with people, how to become a leader, and how to, uh, how to be an entrepreneur too. So what I intend doing is that uh, I will first of all start with my school. So if I'm give, being given a position in my school, I'm supposed to act like a leader. Because they said, for you to act like a leader, you need to show that you got something to show to the public. So. I need to have, I need to act like a leader. I need to have self-confidence in anything I'm doing because lead can taught, taught me about self-confidence and that was an essential tool for, for persons that want to be a great leader. And also, I also want to practice what is called social and dining etiquette. I really learned that a lot from lead camp. So I'm so grateful I got that knowledge. So that's what I want to keep on doing from now on. Well, that self-confidence is shining through because you're so relaxed and you're swinging your feet. <laughs> like who send it? Ah, ah. <laughs> well done. Well done, Thank Abigail. You. Thank so, you. So back to you, um, Solosha. Um, what are the things that you would expect? For instance, um, you, you, you've been doing this, you said, for 20, 23 years. 23 years. Yes. What kind of feedback have you gotten from previous participants? Please don't look straight. <laughs> Definitely not. I won't look at her. Um, it's been mind-blowing, to be honest. I mean, we've had 
participants that have gone out of lead camp and have become leaders in their different endeavors. A good example is Honorable Commissioner for Humanitarian and Girl Development in Delta State already, Udwagan. You know, she's, and she's been back to also give back to the society as well through Jan. She's come to empower young people as well. We've partnered together to empower more girls in Delta State as well. And same applies to other people that have also gone through lead camp. Um, Nkechi Eze, the owner of, founder of Ashwai B. Bella, uh, Bella Niger Affiliated, she's gone through lead camp as well, and she's had amazing feedback. We've had alumnus that have gone through lead camp, and they've come back to give back because they've seen the impact of lead camp, even in their own career journey. And I think the key part of it is also the network that happens at lead camp. It doesn't just give you an avenue to learn. It gives you an avenue to also explore your social skills. So you network with other people, you interact, and you also get to interface with career professionals, experienced professionals that are willing to mentor. So we've had um, experienced professionals come back to say they would like to mentor this person. They would like to engage with this person. They saw their, ex ex you know, they saw their exceptional um, interaction during the camp and they would love to give back. An interesting part that happened this year was during the health and reproductive session we had with mental well-being, um, the facilitators were so keen on helping the girls identify the key skills and the key knowledge they needed to have in being mentally stable and having a healthy relationship that they came back I mean, our shadow was one, once a day to engage with them, but they were keen on having that interaction with them and helping them have the required knowledge to be able to navigate relationships. So they came back the next day and spent extra 30 minutes with the girls, empowering them. And it was an interactive session because, of course, um, we're in a world where different things are happening to young girls and not many people are able to express and share their, their challenges. So that gave them a one-on-one -on -one experience where they were able to share their thoughts, share the, their challenges, and they got the right answers. And we got that feedback from even DCS participants as well, saying this was a unique session for them and they're really appreciative of it. What? what? Okay. Why don't you ask me a question? Yes. Blessing. Uh, when you were talking earlier, you spoke about how your experience at the camp helped you in your professional life. I'm interested in that professional life and how it helped you along. Yes. Yeah, so I'm working as the chief of staff and creative brand manager to Tutu Ade Tumbi. She's the founder and CEO of the Stanford Ham brand, a creative marketing agency in Lagos, Nigeria. Lead Camp instilled in me the courage and confidence to pursue all my ambitions and it helped me believe I can make a significant impact in my chosen field. And that has led me to place higher, higher goals and diligently work towards achieving these goals. What would you say, Abigail, as some of your before and after stories, before you went to the Lead Camp, what was it like and then after? Okay. Before I attended this, produ this program called Lead Camp, I used to feel like it's not everyone that is made to, is made to be a leader. That mm. there are some certain people that are just like have the gifts of being a leader. And someone like, it's not normal. I used to think that it's not normal to have just more than one career. Because so, that was what I was thinking all along. But when I attended this Lead Camp, I then find out that everyone is a leader. If you know what you are doing, you are a great leader. And it's fine if you have more than one career because each and every speaker of that program, let me just say like, at least it should be one of them that just have about two career. The rest, they have like four careers, five careers, and that really inspired me to do what I really want. Interesting. Um, tell me, uh, Tugulola, what are, when you say a union bank is sponsoring, I think you give people money. Let me come <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what? that's an interesting question. <laughs> okay, I would say that, I mean, they, they're not giving us the money, right? What it, what it means is, it's partnership. And now what that means is, of course, there's funding that is accustomed to doing that. And it's to empower the girls. It's to support the girls. So we have resources. We have materials that the girls will have to go through. They have like a, um, they have this um, growth 
session where they go through okay what do you want to become in life what do you want to do so they have this wheel of life that they have to run through right the different aspects of life where they are and i think it's just also interesting for them to also spotlight the key areas where they have developmental needs and all of that so what union bank is doing is basically empowering us to empower the young girls to empower them to equip them with the tools that they require to be the next best thing that that can happen to them so um is there an, another one coming up anytime soon so lead camp happens annually okay. and so the next one is next year and this is also an avenue to reach now to government officials um organizations that are willing to also support and work with us to empower more girls to engage and interact with us and let us know how we can also reach out to more people. We know that pe more people want to be a part of this. And I mean, the more support we get is more opportunities to reach out to more so girls. How do people enroll? Okay, so we we work with schools. Now, the way Junior Achievement Nigeria works is we have partnered schools that are working with us. And so we interface with them to say, okay, um, we want your girls to be a part of lead camp. And so they select the girls. Some are either in SS1, SS2, before they get to SS3, they come and we they select the girls and then we just know that, okay, these are the girls we're working with. Of course, with consent from parents, because most times lead camp happens during summer break and that period holiday is on and all of that. So we get consent from parents, get consent from the government as well to be able to have the students come to school and be a part of it. And I. We also have the opportunity for people to join in virtually from their different locations. So we've had participants that have joined in from their homes, their parents. In fact, this year we had a parent join with their, with their daughter from Abuja. Um, the dad was monitoring the conversation. And when it was time to get into their breakout sessions, we had the virtual session as well, where the girl was really, really delivering and she was interacting all through the session. So it's not limited whether you're in school or not, because we make it open to the public. And the, the, the idea around that is to also show that it's not pegged down to the walls of the school. We want to expand it. We want to reach out to as many people. All you need to do is just get your device and connect. And so we communicate with them as well to say, these are the resources you would need if you need to be a part of this. Just get them ready and then be on standby. And we give them opportunity as well to also interact. So it's not a function of just the students in school. So we have the girls virtually joining from their different locations, interacting with the ones on site, and then all the other participants also engage. Is Union Bank still on board for next year? Well, we believe that that is ongoing. <laughs> we believe that that is ongoing. I mean, they've seen the impact of lead camp so far, and we believe that um, success stories also inform how you want to continue to partner mm. and support a program. And if you've seen the success stories, these are the things that also encourage other people to say, okay, we want to partner. So we believe that Union Bank will definitely be on board. I mean, it's 10 years, and if they stay 10 years, there is something that they're saying. Do any resource persons come from Union Bank? So we have resource persons. Yes, actually. So we have mentors. So there's a mentor session where the girls usually have a presentation um, session after the lead camp. At the end, at the last day, they have a presentation session. And so through the first two days, it's a three-day engagement. So through the first two days, the mentors are interfacing with the students, interacting with them. We also have volunteers. We have a robust volunteer base and so the volunteers would come together as well in their different locations interacting with the students and helping them to own their presentation skills and part of what we did this year was to introduce um, the facilitators to speak on presentation skills ahead of their presentation because that's where we then begin to select the most outstanding participants based on their interactions from the first day to the third day and then even during the presentation we pick the best team that have done so well in presenting so yes it's it's a function of um, dual responsibility with working with Union Bank to mm. execute this. Is there, is there, I, I'm usually very, let me just confess today, I'm usually very iffy about asking about websites. Do you have a website? Oh, definitely. <laughs> we're an organization that has existed for 30 years. So we're 30 oh. this year, and we're definitely going to be inviting the channels team to also celebrate with us. And I mean, 
um, it, it's always a good opportunity to talk about the growth that has happened so far since 1999, you know, that also Lead Camp and all the other programs that we have have, start, have started. And I mean, Junior Bank, the, um, Junior Achievement Nigeria is also um, a sub of Junior Achievement Worldwide. And we currently exist in about 120 countries. So definitely, um, you know, AI, tech world is definitely things that we integrate with and i mean we empower people on digital literacy we definitely have to have a website okay. to be able to amplify that uh, what's that website it's www.juniorachievementnigeria.org juniorachievementnigeria.org yes. well uh, you you have implicated union banks so we have finally <laughs> been able to drag in patricia claire iwewe who is the head citizenship and sustainability of union bank Thank are you, you going to be sponsoring this year we have sponsored this year so next year oh, next, sorry, next year. year oh definitely we have seen the impact just like she has said so, so no, absolutely it's secured <laughs> Do you, do you go to the camp at all? Oh, yes, we do go to the camp. And then, you know, she also mentioned this. I'm talking about you personally. Oh, yes, I attended this year's on, so it was fantastic. I mean, I actually wished that I was a child again to say, oh, I wish I had this in my time. Sorry, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late, Jill. Well, let, let me ask you, so uh, how, how does, you know, uh, supporting this lead campaign uh, align with your organization's corporate social responsibility objectives? Okay, so in terms of um, aligning with our corporate goals and um, values, we we know that um, for Jan and um, for for Lead Camp actually, it's actually a program for it, it aligns with um, SDG three and five. Mm -hmm. so SDG three and five is for sustainability development goals for education and um, empowerment of. Women. female female yeah. women so it really allows union bank is actually really big on this it's we prioritize it we know that um this is actually where we we get big feedbacks from and uh, giving back to our community I, I i want to say that this is perhaps not the only initiative that uh, your organization is involved with that supports um that promotes gender equality and girls oh no not at all not at all this is just actually one of one of it Okay. Um, to also look back at home, back in Union Bank, we have um, a women proposition. Um, I, I would call it, I would call it, um, I wouldn't call it a group anyway, it's actually called Alpha. So in, in Alpha, it's, um, we try to we en enable women, young women, we try to make funds, low, we give them low, low cost funds. We also try to uh, mentor them in terms of um, business opportunities. We, we give them um, platforms to be able to grow their businesses. That's for just Alpha. And then also, we, we also have this international financial congregation where we, we, we partner with them and then also with world economic principles. So these are just amongst, um, what did you just call them, um, initiatives, right? So this, 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 these are just among one of the initiatives we actually use to accelerate and promote SDG 3 and 5. Mm. Awesome. Now, um, Union Bank has done this for 10 years, and you're adding another year to it next year. How has this helped the organization? Oh, it has actually spotlighted us in, um, in ways to say that we are supporting the um, union SDG 17 goals. So in terms of, um, in terms of projecting us, we, we know that we, we have been good in doing such things in, in, um, showcasing ourselves, helping our communities, both externally and internally. And it also, um, it's, it's an opportunity to give back to say that, um, this is what we, we are doing. We're trying to promote people. We are trying to encourage young girls to, um, increase their skills and show their confidence and also give them a mindset, make them ready for the world. So we also have seen the impact. We've done this for 10 years and I mean, still counting. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I, I, I would well, say that. Obviously, if you were not getting any results, you wouldn't be there for 10. Sure. And uh, thinking of going into the 11th. Mm. Sure. Um, okay. Um, so I, I would, I would, let me just confess that I'm outnumbered here. <laughs> no, no, don't be, don't worry. Yeah, safe I'm hands. A, I'm outnumbered here, so, um, but it, It's um, okay, we don't bite. We don't <laughs> bite. Did you say at all? <laughs> okay. All right, well, I, I, the least we can, you know, do is just wish you all, you know, well and trust but that. Just before we go, okay. uh, I, I, I want us to hear from Union Bank as to 
um, can you describe to us the kind of sponsorship that you actually give to the, the uh, lead camp? Okay, so just as Toby has mentioned earlier on, I think we did listen to her. So as a size given, um, if, of course, because we're a bank. I want to hear it from your, from <laughs> no, the horses no, no. now. So, uh, of course, we're a bank, you give money. Yeah, so <laughs> financially we aid, but then we are also support because it is not just by giving money alone. Mm -hmm. So we, we try to be part of the program. So she also mentioned um, towards the end of the program, they make room for us to interact with the students and then make them know that, oh, um, in another few years to come, you're going to go into the business world and then prep them up. So they also have presentations where we get to evaluate them to say that, oh, this is where you have and this is, you can grow in this. And aside that, still congratulate all of them since that everybody is a winner. Yeah. So then they come back to us to say, oh, you have said this, we want to be a banker, I want to work here, I want to do this. So yes that's that's how we do come in man i was actually expecting that you say that at some point you will begin to absorb them into the staff of union bank but hey what do i know there is a chief of staff to some organization seated next to you so who knows what could come out of that i'm not even going to say anything right now thank you so much for being here this morning patricia claire Iwewe, Head Citizenship and Sustainability of Union Bank. Uh, also, thank you, Blessing Obaje, alumna of Lead Camp 2017. Yeah. Interesting. Bigel Mbio, uh, 2024 Lead Camp participant, thank you for your time as well. Oh, by the way, that, that website again is um, www.jnigeria.org. Jan Nigeria. J -A -Nigeria. Yes, jnigeria.org. Nigeria. That's the website right there. Thank you again for being here this Thank morning. To be loved, our show is Marketing Manager, Junior Achievement Nigeria. Thank you again. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you for having us. When we return, children are resuming soon. What are you putting in their lunch bags? Okay, interesting. Jam. Um, please don't ask me about the 18 year minimum age for jam. Why can never yet? Another time. Today we want to talk about children right. that are resuming school, and um, you know, most of the time when we talk younger about children. Younger children, mm, not mm. those ones that are right necking and jam, no, no, and no, jambing. No, 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 not those ones. Even though those ones are also children, but they are not the ones we are talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you know when parents, when children are going to school, um, the kind of things we pack in their food, um, lunch bags. That's the focus of this conversation. I got, I gotta say this earlier. When I was younger, I was going to secondary school. Uh, form one then i was not even a teenager at the time and i was going to school my mom packed so much for me to take to boarding school but there is one i would never forget she fried fish <laughs> <laughs> my mom fried fish and laced it in pepper and put it in that is called Fish yilata. Fish yilata. Yes. Mm. Mm. Fish yilata. Mm. Mm. Your head is not working. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I took that to school. Well, let's just say I will never forget that experience. I don't know what kind of experience you are giving your children, but what, <laughs> or what kind of experience should you be giving your children, particularly now that things are the way they are in our, eco in our economy and in our country. Bimbola Adesami joins us. She is a nutritionist and uh, she's going to be taking us through what you need to put in those lunch, lunch packs. Thank you for joining us this morning, madam. Um, Please don't make fun of me. I had fried fish. <laughs> Fishy <laughs> fish latter. Okay. <laughs> but in the in, looking at our reality in our country now, madam, what are the what are your recommendations? What are the things that we did before that we shouldn't do again? What are the things that are risky to give to our mm. children to put in their lunch boxes in any part of the country? Mm. Thank you for having me, first of all. And uh, your experience resonates with me also. Oh, okay. Be because, uh, <laughs> yeah, because we also, going to boarding house was a whole different experience and 
We tried so many things, even making our sauces in tins, Milo tins, and covering them up. So, <laughs> of course, things have changed now. Uh, if we're going to look at what uh, is prevalent in the country, the hike in food prices, the food poverty across the country, parents have to make choices, right choices to provide adequate diet for their children. And one of the things that they have to consider is the fact that the urbanization has affected so much. We have migrated from what we used to know, the indigenous nutritious foods we need to used to know, to sugar-based foods, mm -hmm. high salt foods, processed foods, which are not all uh, bad, so to speak, but we need to watch out what we are providing for these children. Mm -hmm. So first of all, we need to also look at how can we go back to those indigenous foods? How can we reintroduce them to these children? Uh, how can we get them to understand healthy eating habits, uh, which at the middle school, as you call them, children between the ages of five to nine, that is when they he learn about healthy eating habits and how they can also build uh, a menu, a recipe for themselves as they grow older. Mm -hmm. So definitely these are the things that parents need to put in place as we prepare them for school now. Um. Madam, what kind of foods are you talking about? Um, when my children were in that age bracket, we packed a fruit drink, which most of the time didn't contain any fruit. <laughs> we packed biscuits. Uh, occasionally, we would put a fruit, but I yeah. think that was rare. The occasion was rare that you put a fruit in your child's lunchbox. So what kind of thing are we talking about in today's Nigeria? Well, in today's Nigeria, we can't take away uh, seven food groups, the grains, uh, the legumes. And we'll notice that most children hardly eat breakfast to school, which we should reintroduce to them. Breakfast has to do with a cereal, um, something like pap, something like uh, tapioca, something like oats for them to have just a cup. Tom Brown, Tom Brown is the, is the more nutritious uh, five grain, two legume meal that the children can have just like a drink in the morning that gives them that energy boost uh, for their cognitive uh, work during the day. Then when we pack meals, which is the main meal we pack for them to go to school, we usually play around the grains, rice, uh, spaghetti, indomie. Uh, some uh, explore beans, and so, some explore the tubers, potato, yam. While they are the base meals, we should also look at how to introduce proteinous meals into it, vegetables as well as fruits. So it would be good to also introduce to the children fruits that are in season, that are also uh, protected on its own. Not that we will have to cut something like a watermelon and wrap, rather something like orange that is peeled or banana that is already in its own natural casing. It makes hygiene, uh, the hygiene secure for the children. Mm. And then when we make the rice, uh, we look at how do we make it nutritious using vegetables, using uh, the fish, for example, antichoves, small fish that are used to make sardine, which we have in abundance in riverine areas, Lagos, rivers. Other places can use the small-sized catfish to make the sauce or the vegetable. Um, one of the things that we should remember is that growing up, most of the families had a homestead garden around their household where you don't have to quickly rush to say, oh, I don't have this in the house. You just look outside and pick something that you can easily make a meal with. Your vegetables can easily make a meal. Uh, some other vegetables like the carrots, the cucumber, grow well in household settings and they can easily be introduced to the meals of these children. Yes, the children also have been trained with the increase in um, advertisements and processed foods. They still like their sugary drinks. They, we could introduce more of uh, our own local drinks, which are made from the sorrel leaf, the hibiscus leaf, which is the zobo, which we call it. We also have yogurts that we can give the children. 
that we prepare and we are sure that this is prepared from the home and the hygiene is secure ourselves. Hmm. Interesting that you, you just mentioned Zobo now because I was going to take you up on those processed foods you, you mentioned. It's nutritionists such as yourself would always advise us, you know, guys, uh, close the gap between the farm and table. Uh, and bef between the farm and the table, uh, the distance between the farm to table should be shorter. And the, the shorter the gap, the healthier the meals. That's what we have been told. So uh, there are those who will be wondering uh, where the place of noodles and spaghetti are in that. Yes, I mean, the, this, the reason for this conversation is because we know that uh, the high cost of living is a reality. We, and you have also identified the fact that back in time, that things were easier because there were so many choices, things to choose from. It would seem like those choices are limited now. So uh, in terms of processed foods, which ones are the ones that we can avoid? Which ones are the ones that we can't really do without given the realities that we have to contend with? Well, I, I like your, your question about uh, the, the foods that we no longer have access to. But the question is, do we really no longer have access to them? Because if we, if we go sit back a bit and look at what we are doing now, we are, we, we, I mentioned urbanization where most parents are on the go. And so we look at fast foods, we look at easy meals that uh, are accessible and disposable cash that is around us. And so the child is hungry, you branch at uh, a joint and take meat pie or egg rolls and buy such for the child. Yes, those, those work, but then balancing it with the family meal is also good. So when you look at the indomie, you, your indomie can be spiced with so many vegetables. You can also add the protein, the egg, the chicken, the beef. But of course, with the price inflation right nowadays, the egg is the best bet, or small fish is the best bet. So we have, we, we wouldn't say we condemn meals because a lot of these processed meals happen to be cheaper than the farm products that we claim to have, except if we're growing them at our own backyard. If they're being transported from other areas of the country, the fly price cost with a fuel increase will affect them. So what we all fall back on are the processed foods, the spaghetti and all that, which of course we can enhance from, from the household and that will help. Mm. Interesting. Um, how, is there a role for schools here? Because I'm aware that there are some, we've featured one or two of them here. There are some people carrying along the campaign that we should get, we should ensure healthier meals for children, yeah. particularly because as they grow older, these meals that they have taken, the consequences or the effects of their, some of them, uh, particularly those who have been preserved one way or the other before they were taken by the children. They have long-term effects on them. So that's really the basis of this conversation, madam. Yes. Yeah, so uh, in dealing with child malnutrition, the school has a major role to play. There's a school education system that needs to nurture a lifestyle of healthy eating. And when we talk about a lifestyle of healthy eating, what is sold around the school environment is key. The nutrition education that the children receive within the school premises is key. And the nutrition education has to be spiced with hands-on training. For example, you have a nutritious garden, which we call a school garden, which is used for home economics, which is used for a Greek, and which is used to help children understand that what we grow is what we eat, apart from the agribusiness part of it. The schools should also take charge in regulating the effect of sales of foods, processed foods around their environment. Because once children have easy access to funds, we look at them buying sugary things as against nutritious things. So we have three gold stages in, 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 in childhood where between the ages of zero to two, there's a rapid growth. And then of course we talk about breast milk for them. 
But when you look at between the ages of five to nine, it's another opportunity for catch-up groups. Because at that point, a lot of them who have missed, mal uh, missed nutrients, who have been malnourished, who are stunted or wasted, they catch up there. And when they catch up there, what it means is that they are also able to learn and imbibe a culture of healthy eating. The last group is the adolescents, which is between the ages of 12 and up to 19, where it's another a stage of rapid growth, where their muscle mass is being built, iron is needed for the girls. These are stages where one needs to focus on alongside the development of the brain for mm -hmm. cognitive function and of the schoolwork. Mm -hmm. um, ma ma so those are the different stages that we need. In today's world, where uh, daddy has to go to work, mommy has to go to work yeah. in the morning, everybody's rushing out of the, of the door. Um, how would you advise women to meet these goals that you're giving them to get, give their children um, balanced nutrition to take to school? So as I said, uh, the... The family is, first of all, the learning, the place of learning. So even the mother who is busy should have handy snacks that can easily be pulled together for the child. We need to all go back to this culture of growing what we eat. We need to all go back to seeing a vegetable garden and asking the child, go and get me five leaves of a widow there that I can use for food. They can, we need to say, get me two carrots that I want to put in your mailbox. And you rinse it before the child and put it there. Yes, they have different seasons, but we should have within the house options that we can easily pull onto and say, this is better than the biscuits you are eating. While also being able to prepare healthy snacks for the children that help them to understand why they need to make right choices. So for example, a parent who is very busy should be able to look at something like the egg, boil an egg and keep it for the child to go to school. That is something that you boil an egg while you are doing so many other things, it doesn't disturb. Mm -hmm. You can make pancakes also for the child, which is flour. The flour is fortified. The sugar is fortified, but you can regulate what you are giving your child at home. So those are things that we can still do on the go and also train the children to do themselves and they will have, uh, they will feel empowered to be able to make those choices themselves. You know, I'm just trying to imagine a kind of community gardening <laughs> initiative in some estates <laughs> who don't have land. You know, everywhere is already tarred and paved yeah. and next thing, I mean, you're asking us to go and grow what we eat. It's like you're looking for trouble. Anyway. <laughs> back, back <yard> home. <laughs> so um, uh, while all of these sound fantastic, and I also like the fact that you said that that experience can also help children to learn um, so that they don't say mm -hmm. that they pluck carrots from the tree or that they dig <laughs> oranges from the ground, which is a, you know, a good thing. So for parents now, what are the things that you would advise that they get today before the children resume on Monday or in the subsequent or coming days or weeks from time to time? That is important for their children, particularly those ones are uh, circa toddler ages now. So first thing uh, to help mitigate the effects of uh, price hikes is to buy in bulk. Make sure you have the basic greens in the house. Uh, you could have your rice, your spaghetti, your indomie, but also have the basic ingredients per week that you can now use to mix and match to achieve an adequate diet. A crate of eggs will do for a week without even having to put them in the fridge. You could have uh, dry fish uh, around the house that you could also just crumble to make uh, a sauce for the child to go to school. For those who are also able to get the chicken, it's better to fry them and keep them in the fridge uh, and pick when you need for the child as you go to school also. 
We also have people who, who explore. Uh, in this season, we have a lot of potatoes out. We have plantain out. We should stop with that, either ripe or unripe. They ripen on themselves, and it can be boiled for the child or fried for the child. So all those have to be in the house, not that you buy as you need. You buy and stock per week and allow you to make decisions during the day that this is what I will prepare for the next day. Mm. Well, we have to thank you very much um, this morning for the time that you have spent to educate us on this particular subject matter because uh, food, no child will concentrate in any class if there is no food in the tire stomach or yes, expectation yes. or aspiration that, okay, after this class, I'm going to eat something. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Ms. Bimbola Adesame is a nutritionist. Thank you again for your time today. Thank you for having me. Okay. Usually you would go that at the end of the day, what, we're, what are we talking about before the program is over? We're talking about a home stretch, which is the artist of the week. Can you sing like that? Laura, can you sing like that? Yes, in the bathroom, maybe. <laughs> well, <laughs> I can't sing to change, to save my life. <laughs> well, as someone who can sing, oh, yeah. and of course, as you've been listening to her, Uchechi Emelonye is here with us, a rising Nigerian artist in the Afro soul genre. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Okay, so you decided to sing Afro Soul. Yes, but actually my new EP that I just released is more in the Afro pop realm. I decided to go a bit more contemporary with what I'm putting out now. It's still Afro. <laughs> Afro, everything is Afro, yes. We cannot forget um, my Nigerian roots. That's what I always want to keep in my music. Okay, you, you've been out for a bit. Yes, I've been away in the UK completing my studies. I've recently just completed my master's in law, so now I'm free to pursue my other passion, which is music. Here what's, we go. Again. What's the <laughs> law degree for mom and dad? You know what? It actually wasn't because I'm really passionate about helping people as well. So, you know, if I was to get an education... Pro bono law, you're sitting right here. <laughs> <laughs> for free. I mean, if you need it. Um, yeah, so I love helping people and that's why I wanted to do law. And then as well, I've just always had artistic abilities and been musically inclined. So obviously, mom and dad were like, education first, but it wasn't for them. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. So now you're going to pursue your passion. Yes, I'm going to pursue which my passion. Which is music. Which is music now, yes. Um... <laughs> you don't intend to pursue law at all? Um, I think law is definitely still going to be in my life. I feel like maybe further down the line, I'd get into more entertainment law. That's something I'm very interested in as well. Copyright law? <laughs> copyright law. Is that maybe. in there somewhere? Yes, it is. I love <laughs> copyright law. So um, I found a way that both my passions can be merged and then for me to pursue both of them as well. So. Here comes Senior Advocate of Music. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully one day. <laughs> okay, so um, why do you choose music of all? Um... I don't know. Music was just always something that connected me and my family members. My dad and mom would always play music in the car when we drive um, back home to the village for Christmas. They would always play their CDs of Madonna and Celine Dion and we'd know their like title tracks from back to front and yeah I just really loved it and I looked up to a lot of artists that were on stage I used to watch I don't know if you know but Hannah Montana uh, oh. on Disney Channel and so I just wanted to be like her and have the best of both worlds so you didn't prefer to do a logo what's that sorry oh god <laughs> and you are from Imo State I'm so sorry I didn't hear you properly a logo dancers you doesn't know them you doesn't know at a logo, Dan. I do what know is them. She talk, what is she talking about? Anyway, so where were we? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now you have been recognized yes. with prestigious awards like the BBC Music intro um, introducing uh, Record of the Year 2022, New Female Artist of the Year. How did, how did all, that, all this come to be? 
Um, both of them were actually surprises to me, which makes me really honored that I was considered. <laughs> I still think I deserve them, but I didn't expect um, them to come my way. For the BBC introducing one, my university was the one that alerted me and they're like, we've heard your name on the, u- the news in association with the university and you've won this award. And I was like, wow, I didn't know. And what was even more amazing about that award was that the... Um, the on-air personality told me it was between two of my songs that I had submitted for playlisting and that was really cool to know that they were struggling between my songs. <laughs> <laughs> so, first Uchechi, second Uchechi. Yes, <laughs> basically. So, yeah, that made me really happy because um, I'm a songwriter as well. I write all my songs myself. So, just knowing that they really resonated with the lyrics and what I created was really important to me. Now, what's, would, what signature would you like to put on your music identity? I want to put that it's unique. You know, it's a unique, fun, catchy sound. Like, you're always going to remember it, but it's not like what you're hearing right now because my music is a blend of different things. It's a blend of all the cultures that I've experienced in my childhood, all the influences from my parents' age of music as well. It's a blend of just the things that I like and the places I've been, so, hmm. yeah. And what influences your music? Where do you get your inspiration from? Is it nature? Mm. Is it things that happen around you? I was actually a really um, avid uh, literature and writing student. I love English language and writing. So yes, for example, um, I could get some um, inspiration from nature. My underwater song is from nature. It's all about water. I love those kind of themes. You know, the ones where your teachers would ask you to analyze it in class and, you know, find the depth in it. Um, So yeah, I get my inspiration from nature. And then I also get my inspiration from my experiences and the experiences of those clothes closest to me. What's, so, the, what's the message of your music character? I'm just relatable. <laughs> I'm probably talking about something that you know and you've been through, which is either love, self-love as well, not just love for another person, confidence, growth, struggles. Um, those are a lot of themes that I explore in my music. And what, are, what kinds of, well, beside the awards, because you're going to tell me that the award is testament. <laughs> what kind of reactions have you gotten from different people about your music? I think the most important one is just (laughs) I'm going to tear up but when my friends like cry from my songs for example my underwater song is really important to one of my friends so those kind of things just make me really happy those kind of emotional reactions is what I want to get from people. Well you need to tell us about this underwater music. (laughs) You know, we need to know more about it. Is that if why it's you're... moving people to tears? <laughs> like it's moving her right now. Um, you're gonna find it really funny. I actually created it in the shower. <laughs> why am I not surprised? <laughs> Underwater. Mm-hmm. Underwater. It's connecting. It's hmm. making sense. So I was in the shower, but then also at the same time, my friend had opened up to me about some struggles, and so. I had decided I would make a song for her so that, you know, make her feel better. That's what I want my music to do to people. I want it to make them feel better. I say that I make music for the heart and the soul. Mm. Yeah. So what, what, how, how do you, who's your producer, by the way? Um, I've worked with a lot of different producers, yes. both in Nigeria and the UK. I've worked with ID Kabasa, and he produced one of the songs on my new EP called Over You. And then, but most of the, the all the other songs on the EP are produced by uh, my producer, Frankie G Music. You'll forgive me for asking. <laughs> What's it like working with ID Kabasa? Very, very cool and very like quick and fluid. So the Over You song we made, we got the hook in less than 30 minutes and that was really fun to do as well and we were just bouncing ideas off of each other and it was very insightful as well because i was transitioning from my more contemporary soulful kind of like western style of singing into getting into the nigerian you know catchy groovy style and so he was teaching me a lot of pigeon (laughs) (laughs) to add to my songs yeah and uh, what was that experience like for you It was really fun as well because uh, my older brother was there with me, who, by the way, is the CEO of my record label, Emma Lux Records. And he he and I write music sometimes together. So we were all just in the room bouncing ideas off each other and we made a really good song. Tell us about this song. 
<laughs> Which song? <laughs> this song. So this song I performed last year at the TD Africa. This is Baby You. It's the last song before my new release and it's just a love song. I was actually playing um, CK's Emiliana on my ukulele and I really, really fell in love with the way the chords sounded. So I decided to put my own lyrics on it and then I created Baby You. Did you say ukulele? <laughs> yeah, I play a few instruments as well. Such as? Such as the ukulele, the guitar, the bass guitar, the piano. You play the bass guitar? Yeah, I love the bass. I'm not good at it, but I love the bass. <laughs> and you play the microphone as well? Oh yeah, that's my my main instrument of yeah, choice. Yeah, because I also play the microphone. Okay, maybe yeah. we can, you know, get you yeah, to I'm playing feature. the microphone right now. Oh, okay, yes. okay, I get it. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, um, get me singing in the bathroom mm. under the shower mm. is one thing. Underwater. Underwater. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. <laughs> is one thing. Getting into the music industry, uh, that's another kettle of fish altogether. Yeah. Um, so, tell us about your that transition for you. Tell us what it feels like to be to get into the music industry for young people such as yourself now who are watching and I'm wondering, I want to do what she's doing. Mm. I think it's, to be honest, not very easy, but I think I'm so blessed to have been cushioned by my dad, my mom, my parents, my family. They've really come support us. Like I said, my record label is, the CEO is my older brother, so it's everything's family oriented. And because of them, I have nothing to fear. I have all the support, all the backing, but I feel like it's really hard if you don't have any support and backing in the music industry. But 100%, if you've got talent and you keep working at it, you will make it. Mm. You will get Michael noticed. Jackson also came from a music family. <laughs> don't forget Maybe we're that. trying to copy. <laughs> and he, he, he didn't have it so easy eventually. Mm. That's the basis of the question. Mm. So I, I want to assume that you, you've anticipated some challenges that may be contended with. Um, I think the biggest challenge for me is just to get recognition. Um, I think just to reach audiences because I feel like once I do reach, I will connect. But it's just really hard to reach audiences in Nigeria. Lots of people are going through different things. And I just think hopefully when I reach them, my music will you know, help their heart and soul feel a little bit better in such difficult times. So you know that was our problem is too much. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why we have such good music. Mm. Yeah. So you said you want your music to be relatable. Yeah. Any particular message you want that whenever I have this, when I, whenever I want to feel good or feel mm. better about a situation, a particular sphere of situation, I want to remember. Uchechi. Mm. I think I want to be remembered when people are not feeling good to then feel better. So like when you're not feeling good, I want you to be like, I'm going to put Uchechi Emelonye's music on and then that's going to instantly cheer me up. For example, in my new EP, I have a song called Dance and it's literally about my mom telling me to not hold on to things too tight, you know, just to like let things go and as it's easier to turn up the music a little bit so you can dance your problems away. I have other songs about like not sticking to the margins, which is just about like picking yourself up, believing in yourself and having confidence to get through what you're going through right now. I think hopefully that, you know, bad times won't last. And I think music helps those bad times kind of go faster mm. or go a little bit easier. Do you anticipate a time when you have to do some... Okay, now let me ask, let me put it this way. If you are to collaborate with anyone musically, mm -hmm. who are the people you would consider? What kinds of artists? Um, I like artists who have a really unique voice. I like artists who, you know, really care about their lyrics as well. Um, if we're talking in the Nigerian sphere, I would love to collaborate with the likes of Tens, Fireboy, Johnny Drill, Joe Boy. I'd like to collaborate with everyone, <laughs> basically, um, that just is passionate about music the same way I'm passionate about. I love being in a space where, like I said, we can just bounce off of each other because we just care about what we're doing so much. Mm. But we're not very strong on lyrics in this part, are we? 
I think some are. Some are. We dwell, we dwell on the rhythm more than anything else. We just want to dance. Mm, exactly. We want, we want a boogie. You want to shake. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. No, I think um, the Nigerian creativity with lyrics is in its own category of creativity. Thank I you. think there's something that Nigerian <laughs> artists do different with the rhythm and sounds that it's not necessarily the words that bring meaning, but you bring sound into words which is very very interesting i think that's what nigerians do differently so i'd like to explore that type of creativity with lyrics and i'd like to explore my type of creativity you know the english student who used to read a lot of books type of creativity so are you back finally now you say you just finished your masters you're back finally yes so i'm going to be seeing more of you in the music scene now. oh a hundred percent i mean you've already started seeing more of me oh, thankfully okay. now and you, <laughs> you yes i'm back home to settle i'm happy to be back home the food is good the weather is good you know i'm with family so yeah um you'll be seeing a lot more of me in fact tonight i'm performing at an event i'm performing at the mainland block party with dj neptune <laughs> the first thing she said she is, is good is food. I was going to ask which one in particular. <laughs> oh, that's so hard. Niger has so many good food. Um, I can tell you the one that I've been eating the most. Um, I've been eating a lot of abacha. I don't know if you guys have had it before. That's, that's the Igbo salad. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Igbo girl. <laughs> All right. What else? Um, lots of suya. Lots. <laughs> I've had okay. pepper soup, I've had oha soup, I've had pounded yam. I've had literally everything since I've been back. I've just been running to get it. I've had granats as well. I just love eating. I love food. Yeah. <laughs> well, it doesn't show. <laughs> <laughs> You're too I kind. Didn't say it. I didn't say it. You're I, too... <laughs> I didn't say it. I can nothing. tell you guys are like, what is she talking about? I, yeah. I, have, I didn't say it. You love food, do you? I do love food. I know it's... May, it might be a little difficult for some people to believe, but just ask my family. I love food. <laughs> no, okay. Well, she loves food. She eats a lot. And it's good that it doesn't show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. The way to a woman's heart is through her stomach. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You think it's What's only men that love to enjoy food? for the gander. <laughs> <laughs> we have to let you go finally. Oh no! Uh, yes, <laughs> I've been having fun. With you She's guys. having fun. Yeah. <laughs> you know that when you go to shows, they pay for pay. You. When you come for this show, you pay. Oh, I'm just okay. saying. Just saying. Better. I'm paying with my company, right? Uchechi, <laughs> Emelonye. <laughs> yes. That get you. it right. You got it perfectly. Okay. Rising Nigerian artist in the Afro soul genre hails from Imo State and does not know uh, Atilogo. Anyway, thank you so much. <laughs> no, you cannot end it on that. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I know it, but I probably just know it. Oh, from... Don't worry, Daddy is going to ask you. You, you doesn't know. Anyway, no. thank you so much for your time. This no, time. thank you so much for having me. Have okay. a nice rest of your show. Okay. And Uchechi brings to a close today's show. <clears throat> and I am glad that I am back.